Welcome back to Dev Dive episode 27. I'm your host, Nighthawk. Today, my guest is Liquid Red Necra, community manager for Team Liquid. Thanks for joining me today and uh, on the show. Let's get right into it. So let's talk a bit about um, how you actually got into community management, because community management has always been something that I've been very interested in as a person, um, especially in the esports uh, era. Mm-hmm. So, so um, did you have any educational background in, in this sort of field? Um, not in terms of education, but definitely in terms of previous work experience. Mm-hmm. Um, with, obviously, community managers and things like that, they're, they're a more modern job. So even getting education for it is kind of not very common. Um, but I had a, a big work history and things come on. I've done restaurant hosting, restaurant waiter. I've done a lot of other like close personal one to one jobs. Um, I've helped in the like, hobby stores for different pin card games and things like that, and like, miniatures, those kinds of environments that are like sort of geek niche. Um, and I think just coming forward from that gave me the platform. Um, and then obviously. The, the most important thing is you have to love the thing that you're going to interact with, especially as a community manager. You can't represent something that you don't actually love. Yeah, definitely. So um, being a fan so, of yours on that helped. <laughs> I guess to start out with, how long have you actually been doing uh, this for Team Liquid? Uh, it will come up for three years and a couple of weeks. I'm, wow. I'm getting very close to university with Team Liquid. Um, getting into the, the job was kind of fortuitous almost because it was not long after I'd moved country. I'd moved to the Netherlands. Um, so I tried to find an online post. And it's one of those posts that you like you see online and you think, all right, well, I'll apply for it. it it'd, be, it'd be nice to get. And I hadn't paid much attention to it. Sure as fate, I got back. I got me in. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I always see posts like that, especially on, on sites like Hitmarker, where you're like, well, should I even bother tossing my hat in the ring? Because... Blah, blah, blah. 100%. Yeah, it's great to hear a success story for once because you do hear a lot of um, ones where you're just like, oh, I went for the interview and then they never got back to me. But yeah, it's awesome to hear. Um, so about three years now, uh, what were you doing? Yeah. Um, so this, this was like your first um, job in the esports industry? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I started off doing uh, community moderation and helped with like the, the platforms that we use, particularly Discord. Mm-hmm. Um, helped organize little things like the viewing parties that we do for uh, like live matches we try and all get together and watch the game on the Discord um, and it started off as that and then just over years my responsibilities grew um, and my, my title expanded with it and now I'm doing full, um, just a full community manager and I lead a lot of facilitation on projects which is cool yeah, so so let's talk about what a facilitator does because I'm not actually super familiar with that job title. <laughs> yeah, so um, whenever you whenever you make a project, um, and you you're, like, you're doing all the plan and things like that, everything's coming together. Everyone knows that what you want to do, um, eventually it gets to the like, how do we do that? Like, how how do we get these little parts together? And any question from that that starts with someone should do this, like <laughs> someone needs to have this done, like your tag at that point is someone. Like that's who you are. Like someone needs to set up this page. Someone needs to get these people in contact with each other. Someone has to do this. Someone has to do that. Like, and it's just all of these little tiny jobs that clear up the, like the the professionals in their field. Like, if I do the coordination and facilitation at the back end, the graphics team don't have to worry about things like that. The social media team have less to worry about. The but and any any anything that you can lighten the load off of someone so they can focus on their good thing, then that's a success in my book for what a facilitator does. Yeah, it definitely it almost sounds a little bit like a project manager role or like a producer role, um, facilitating yeah. like kind the, of. Uh, yeah, um, facilitating. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. On you go. On you go. On I keep interrupting it. Um, just like making. I, I've definitely. I haven't had enough producers on the show to to make an educated statement on this, but it sounds like a similar role where, where something like that mm-hmm. would be. It maybe um, in a in a different industry. 
yeah, like the facilitation in um project management are essentially the same thing. The only difference is the decision maker. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, like, it's very frequent that a lot of project managers will uh, take on the role of the, the facilitator themselves. Like they'll get all the little things tidied up. But the reason that you bring on a facilitator is because a facilitator can focus on all of the micro stuff. Like they can take all the like all of the tiny parts to the project and put mm-hmm. them together. Um, whereas a project manager, if you do it that this way, then a project manager can oversee from the top and see all of the macro elements, which then allows them to project manage multiple things. Um, oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Now I, I see, I see now. Um, you ba- like basically everything that a facilitator does is buy time for someone else. <laughs> Like and, great... and it's you wear as the long most as you amount of hats. Up. Yeah, well, uh, like I'm I'm not, I'm never drawing anything. Like I'm never I'm never performing somewhere. I'm never drawing or creating a graphic or designing something. Um, but really, in all of the communication between all of the people who are doing stuff, again, it's just anything that takes time to do. That's just a little extra thing. It's just having that one person that comes in and clears it all up and tidies everything puts it nice, and then acts as a contact point for everybody else, so that they don't have to, like, maybe bother the person who's in the middle of a meeting or doing their thing. And... Yeah, It's fun. I really it. enjoy it. I really, really enjoy it. That makes a lot of sense. How small do you think an organization, like, or sorry, how large do you think an organization would have to be to benefit from somebody uh, like you doing that sort of role? Um... I mean, I, I can imagine it being anyone anyone that does more than one project at the same time. So, like, even small teams can just just need someone to communicate things and store everything in a central place. Um, like, even even a quiet hotel has, like, someone at the front desk. Do you know what I mean? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, like, and that's, like, maybe they do, like, a, a bit of tidying around or whatever. I think it's it's not that different. Um, it's just all about. Like if you if you're hiring professionals to do a job, then if you can make that person's job easier, you're essentially trading their time so that they can focus on the thing that they're actually brought on for, um, and giving that like those little jobs to someone else. Um, yeah. Usually, love, usually it's a net gain in time. I love drawing comparisons between. Um, other to like other industries, so people can get a better idea of what's going on. So I like your analogy there. Um, yeah. <laughs> getting back towards uh, the community management side of stuff, uh, do you mm-hmm. cover like basically all of the communities that Team Liquid houses, like Smash, League of Legends, Dota? Uh, I know they're very, um, very uh, varied these days. Yeah. So I try and keep into contact with as many different esports as possible. Um, but we will always have, for for someone like myself who tries to watch over everything, we'll still have people who have a, just a stronger understanding in the scene. Um, like I would never claim to be the person with the most league knowledge or Dota two knowledge, CS:GO, Clash Royale, etc., etc., etc. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, but at least if I if I know enough about the foundations on all of these esports, if someone new tries to come into the community and they don't know where to go, they don't know where to look, at least I can say, like, well, here's these people, and I can hold a bit of the, like, the initial conversation with them, and then if they want to get into something a bit deeper, then we've got people who understand it a little bit. Yeah. Um, off the top of your head, do you know how many uh, like aspects of esports that TL is into these days? Because you named a few that I hadn't uh, even thought of. <laughs> I want to say 18. Off the top of my head, I think it's 18. That's crazy. Um, the number has been up recently. With our, well, we got, we got into Rocket League recently. We're definitely looking at a couple of other things. Um, we have designs to like make sure that we anything that we get into, we want to make sure that we present accordingly. Like we want to give value to the scene. We don't want to just hire players for the sake of hiring players. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, something that a lot of people in NA might not realize, and I didn't know until I did some more research into Team Liquid, is that Liquid is like one of the oldest esports organizations out there, pretty much. And it started in, in Europe, which was 
uh, because they yeah. only came. I feel like I don't know if this is true, but I feel like they only came into vogue in, in NA over the past uh, like decade or so. Um, depends on the scene that you're in. Mm-hmm. Like anyone who anyone who has been in StarCraft, um, particularly StarCraft Two, for a long time, like they're going to know people like um, TLO. They're going to know people like um, Nazgul, Victor Cousins. Um, like they'll have known and, and TLNet, obviously the foundation platform. Um, the, that's been going for twenty years. We're literally celebrating our twentieth year this, like just at the end of last year. There. Oh wow! Um, it's crazy. We are, Can you believe we, that esports has been around for twenty years? Wow. I I work with people younger than Liquid. <laughs> is that depressing? I am. Um, or is that exciting? I'm in the, I don't know. Like I'm born. I was born in the eighties, so. Um. I'm kind of used to being like slightly older than the people that I'm around, um, but young, younger than oldest esports organization on the planet is like those. Like those are words, and when you try and line them up together, it's it's, like, it's pretty big. Like <laughs> it's getting there too, and and I think we'll see over the course of the years. I mean, I, something that I thought of the other day was it's it's hilarious. I play a lot of League of Legends, so that's something I'm familiar with, mm-hmm. but. Um, there are people who play League of Legends who were not alive when the game came out <laughs> in 2009 yeah. or 2010. It's crazy. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I've, I've definitely been utterly clapped at like, StarCraft and games like that by people who just who got into the game as their first game that they played. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember trying to find people on Battlefy and GameSpy and stuff like that to play Heroes of Might and Magic 3 Game on. Spy. And that was like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember like, GameSpy. <laughs> they used to host um, servers for Halo Combat Evolved. I remember playing that on PC a lot. Um, <laughs> oh, the PC version of Halo. Yeah, that was it. Was a mess. <laughs> it was. I mean, it was good, <laughs> but the uh, the servers were interesting. A lot of uh, shit. what's the map name? Like no one, literally no one in the planet calls something. Or they they never refer to something as interesting unless they're just being polite. Like, <laughs> like no, no, I'm 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 very guilty for it because it, it's the word that I fall back on as well when I'm trying to be polite. Just in some interesting decision making. Like. <laughs> no, no, Which, okay. So I feel like I feel like I I am guilty of that sometimes, but I don't want to say that I only use it when I'm trying to be like polite and something's not not um not interesting. Because I'll, I definitely, I'll, I've definitely said it before. It's a filler word for me where like if I'm thinking of something yeah. else and I'm like sort of just like listening in the background, I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm about, I'm probably about three to one on what's like interesting and that was unique. Um, <laughs> like if I'm just being polite, I'm just trying to like, if, I, if something's good, I'll just say that it's good. If I think that something is different or unique or <laughs> like nice. That was that was nice. <laughs> Do you um, work with a lot of people from America? Uh yeah. Uh, actually, so I live in Europe and I'm in the Netherlands right now. But even my my life schedule is uh, West Coast. Mm-hmm. So, um, as much as it's ten past one in the morning here, this is really the middle of my day. Um, I'll get up for like, I'll get up mid afternoon and then go to sleep at like. 5 6 a.m. Um, we got something in common then. Uh, I just shifted over to night shift at my job, so I'll be staying up very late uh, for this appear- you just the future. Like, <laughs> yeah, basically, I'm going to be up until 8 a.m. every day, which is uh, a real gamer schedule, I'll have to say. Uh, but anyway, what I was going to be talking <laughs> about <laughs> when I was uh, asking if you worked a lot with a lot of people from America is. Um, have you noticed your vocabulary and like mannerisms changing to sort of like shift to fit, uh, like our vocabulary and culture? Um, I'm not going to say that I've noticed it, but I definitely don't want to say that it hasn't happened. I feel like it almost certainly has happened, but it's not <laughs> something that I've been cognizant of. Um, I've definitely noticed people pick up Scottish mannerisms. Um, I became a lot more cautious about using the C word. People react when you use that word, but that's like very common parlance <laughs> if you're from Glasgow. Um, but I'm, I was born and raised in Glasgow in Scotland, so 
like words like that, but like they're just words like swear, swearing in Scotland is just it's definitely more of a you can hear the intent and in versus the word choice. Um, like the word choice isn't what matters, like the way that it's said matters far more. Mm-hmm. Um, but like that's obviously something culturally that's different in the US, like words have meaning. Like I can't just call someone like <laughs> the C word and they'll just be like, all right, whatever. Like, there's a reaction. <laughs> I feel like that's that's uh, very similar to what's happening in like Australia right now, where they have a lot of um culturally uh interesting terminology yeah. that, that gets thrown <laughs> around a lot. Um and now that they 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 are sort of like interacting with other countries a lot more. It seems like people are like, oh, oh do you really talk like that? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's, there's, it's, been, it's been really, really fun over the last three years getting, like, obviously, everyone around the world gets a taste of American culture because it's the, the a culture center for a lot of TV shows, movies, music. Um, so you see a lot of it, and like you, you, you know how that's just like an American thing. But there's obviously a lot of stuff that just doesn't show up in TV shows and movies. And learning all of that has been pretty cool. But there's like the learning what the um, electoral college was recently was <laughs> like I don't I know watch... what you guys are doing over there. But like, <laughs> I watch a lot of uh, videos about uh, by Jay Foreman who who does some interesting videos about. Um, politics in the UK and learning about like the House of Parliament, the backbenches and stuff like that. It's very interesting from a from a North American's perspective because you're like, this system has been in place for thousands of years or like a thousand years and it seems just that shit crazy to me. But then when you take an eye yeah. on like how our politics goes, obviously right now especially, it's pretty crazy. Um like our system is like less than 300 years old or around 300 years old and um it's pretty terrible too like you think they could have made some pretty nice changes <laughs> but i don't know we'll see well if life changes need to show up in the patch notes before you realize that maybe something's fundamentally not squared up here like <laughs> 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 um, so so this is a question that i was interested in a lot because i know that my my work i do um educational technology stuff uh my schedule changes a lot based on um what time of year it is because obviously when school's in session oh, yeah. things are different um but is it the same thing sort of thing for esports like when uh the international ramps up for dota or lcs or sorry lec for for europe and stuff like that do things get a lot crazier and then you have downtime between them what what sort of schedule shifts happen during those things yeah, there's definitely always going to be like a certain minimum level that, like the the day to day stuff. Like we're always going to be trying to keep new things going, and if there is like downtime for big events, then we we do try and have things like for to be for people to take part in and like keep going. Um, particularly when we're in as many esports as Team Liquid represent, like there's always going to be the next tournament. Like there's always. Like there's TSL that we do for StarCraft. We've got things like the Grid for Rocket League. We've got things like our PUBG teams in Korea right now. Um, and even so, like uh, the schedule can change on so many different factors. What we do in a day to day thing, like you were talking about, like so, say the international comes up. It's the biggest individual esport event of the year. So naturally, people are just going to be busier at that time. There's just mm-hmm. no getting around it. Um, it's the same for uh, the League of Legends Worlds, League of Legends Finals in North America. We put on as much as we can extra, especially if we're doing well, um, which we've been blessed with over the last couple of years. We've had really strong performances. Um, so, like, there's that. And then the teams that do a lot of international travel, that, like, even if the tournaments themselves are in a consistent schedule, having the team be in different locations can also affect the scheduling. So, like, if the, the, say in the CSGO team, who is a North American team, say they play six events, but those six events can be in, like, Dubai, Paris, New York, uh, Shanghai, like, they can be literally anywhere in the world. So you need to adjust to that on top of 
how busy the event is. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is yes, very fluid. <laughs> <laughs> um, shoot. I was going to say, like, what what sort of uh, roadblocks do you run into? Because you mentioned um, working with teams out of like, Korea and Shanghai and stuff. Do, I'm yeah. sure the, the language barriers is a big thing to overcome. Um, I know that all these areas mm. have their own sort of, like, localization teams for, for esports yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, so but... Team Liquid specifically actually has, like, a full um, team for uh, Portuguese because we represent... Um, a number of different interests in Brazil. Um, our Rainbow Six team is Brazilian. Our Free File team is Brazilian. And having someone who, having a team even that's out there, um, like we have Brazilian specific community managers, we have people who specialize in Brazilian social media. Because um, even one of the most interesting roadblocks, which thankfully is something that's dealt with by more by other people than myself, um, is just how do you interact with different cultures? Because every individual game has its own culture. The region that's prominent for that game has its own culture. Even if you're not in one of those regions, when the team travels to that region, it's going to have a different culture. Um, so, and like, that's even before you, like you said, you start looking at languages. Um, we we have taken the default stance where we try and interact as much as we can in English and we'll, uh, in Portuguese for the Brazilian fans. And we try our best to keep everyone involved and even non... Like, people who aren't necessarily strong speakers of a language, like, as strong speakers of English, we try and get them on board. Um, we also do, like, some amount of um, Chinese localization. We have a couple of members of staff who are great at doing that. Um, so we we try to get everyone involved. Um, I'm not going to say it's like a hundred percent successful because I don't think anything will ever get to be a hundred percent globally mm -hmm. accepted like that. I just I, I I don't see it. But we we want to try our hardest to make sure that it's as comfortable as possible for a Chinese fan, as as a Brazilian fan, as as a Dutch fan, as as an American fan. Yeah, it's a massive hurdle. Um, I I really like what you said about how every basically facet of esports has a different culture and a different community where it's not just, not all League of Legends yeah. fans are the same. It's going to be a lot different in League of yeah. Legends NA versus League of Legends uh, Korea or China or mm -hmm. even uh, South America. I know they have a, a very thriving uh, esports scene down there for, for League of Legends. Um, yeah. And it's just not something I, I ever get to see much because obviously I only speak English <laughs> like a dirty American that yeah. I am. Um, so it, it's hard to get like sort of engrossed in that culture. Um, uh, yeah, um, it's it's honestly it's it's never going to be easy. I don't think it'll ever get easy. Um, unless like we find someone who just like that's their superpower is that they're like omnilingual. <laughs> I just like you, it's not, not going to happen. Like, <laughs> do you think why, we'll see a future oh, yeah. in um? in the next maybe 500 years where we sort of all gravitate, humans in general all gravitate towards a singular language or at least a, a common language. Um, Cause that, th that would make things a lot I can, easier. <laughs> I, can, I can definitely see something just going haywire where the situation's more forced. Um, like I can see some like, some terrible accident happening where like everyone has to sort of converge in central locations. Five hundred years. Like the year two thousand five hundred is a long way away. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, I I think th there's already certain amounts of globalization happening. Um especially with like uh China being more open to the rest of the world and more accessible. Um Technology becoming more available in sort of poorer areas. Um, that obviously increases their exposure to international culture. Um, like those places aren't just going to get swallowed up, they're either going to contribute or isolate, um, but they won't just get absorbed. So it's hard. I, I don't. Yeah. 
if you if you pointed like a weapon at me and said pick one, I would say probably. I think in five hundred years, everyone's going to be speaking one language, but um, it's hard to imagine how it gets there. Yeah, it, it's it. When I was younger, it felt like English was becoming this more and more monolithic thing that that everyone was getting into. But as I got mm. older, I sort of realized that it seemed that way because I only interacted with other people who spoke English. So every bit yeah. of, every aspect of my life was in English. I'm like, oh, obviously everyone's going to be speaking English in 100 years. But as I got older and I interacted with more people from around the world, I'm like, okay, Eng- there's a lot of English speakers out there, especially even in Europe and, yeah. and South America. But there's also a lot of people who don't even know the first thing about English. They're not interested in learning it. They're not. Huh. It's just not part of their life. And that's that's just like, it was so mind-blowing to me to to realize that. and and. I think the the crazy thing is, is that uh, we're the minority by far, where English speakers are are not even. I think we're in the like the top three spoken language, <laughs> and, and <laughs> uh, Mandarin and and uh, Hindi are like above us by a, a large amount. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I think one of the things that like you can really point to as a a stamp on this kind of thing as well is you. When when I bring up if I if I talk about Twitch, right, you're obviously going to think of it's an American company. It's um it's based out of the United States. A lot of the content that comes out of it is based out of English. But the largest stream ever was in Spanish. Yeah, I know. I, I want actually wanted to talk about that. That was a super. That's- that was a crazy event to me because it came out of nowhere for me. I just like saw it happen, show up on my Twitter. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So I show up on the stream and this guy's speaking in Spanish and, and he's sitting at, um, I think he reached 2.5 million views, which, um, concurrent, put, by the way. what's that? Concurrent. Oh yeah. Concurrent views, which, which is crazy. Uh, <laughs> people who aren't familiar with Twitch, um, concurrent viewers is a lot like even for large events is usually a lot lower than like of amount of views on a YouTube video. Like a YouTube video might reach 10 million, 20 million views, and that's considered very popular. But for a Twitch streamer, 50,000 to 100,000 viewers, that is like the, a very, very, very top percentage of people. Um, so for somebody to reach 2.5 million, which uh, to put into some perspective, like previous records were at something like 600,000. And that yeah. was very high at the time. Everyone was like, oh, this is going to be the biggest thing ever. Um. And and it felt like it was very spontaneous. Uh, I know it was like sort some sort of Fortnite skin event. Um, and obviously, this guy was very popular beforehand. He has six million followers on on Twitch. But yeah. It it does feel like very spontaneous, where like this just happened, which is an exciting feeling. I I think uh, Epic Games and Fortnite have really captured some sort of lightning in a bottle to to allow for these spontaneous and, and exciting events to grip culture gaming culture in general not just for their game yeah um i think that the interesting thing for me as well is people people like the the guy in question um Griff, he has experience like if you look at the top 10 largest ever streams like he, his name appears a couple of times so it's not unfamiliar ground so a lot of people were looking at it like Yo, maybe he breaks like a million. Like this is very reasonable for him to break a million viewers. Um, and that was the conversation about like how exciting would it be? So like two and a half is that's nuts. Like it's it so is. cool to see. I I don't think we'll see that number because it was sort of like a a unifying moment in in Twitch culture where mm-hmm. people who have no idea who this person is because obviously they don't speak Spanish or or whatever are coming in and they're like, I want to be part of this milestone yeah. in Twitch history because this is the most viewed stream ever. Um, yeah. And he was getting sure. a lot of, a, a lot of uh, inlets from all sorts of different creators and stuff. Yeah. Because like, as it starts, there's obviously like, you'll see it. Like, uh, there's a very telltale snowball for how things like this happen mm-hmm. because the initial instance starts off. And I think he was at just in like, in the just chatting thing on the, the wind up, he's at like, 200,000, which is obviously Jesus, how, how do you reach this? So people start talking about how exciting that is that he's at 200,000 before everything's going on. 
people then see that there's this really big stream, so they 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 get on board, and they they go to see what's happening. That increases the numbers. Now we're looking at people talking about how it's growing, and news outlets are taking notice because it's something that is big, that is growing, and it's this unique cultural phenomenon. So they put out their post, like some like they some day writer is out there on the spot trying to conjure this story so that they can get like clicks and links. Mm-hmm. And therefore, like every news outlet is trying their hardest to get something out quickly, which then in turn brings more eyes, brings the same effect, the snowball, but this time it's on a, bit, a much bigger scale. Um, and then eventually what happens is you you get two and a half million and the Fortnite skin's really cool and it does all, <laughs> it like evolves and it does all this other cool stuff. And like in the middle of the, the, the reveal, you've got people saying like, you should come and see this. Like, it's really cool. It does all this other stuff. It's not just a normal skin. It does all this extra. And like their friends are being pulled in and you've already got a big number. It's yeah, and it definitely it definitely benefited from the fact that Fortnite um, is a juggernaut in terms of Twitch viewership, and it it's, has been oh, yeah. basically since it came out. So you have yeah. all of these people who are very excited about Fortnite, and they're coming in, they're being like, "Hey, Fortnite and skins and stuff," um, and that that transcends sort of the language barrier for a lot of people. And then you had, like you said, people who have no idea what's going on in either Fortnite or this this culture. Um, and mm-hmm. they just coming in because they see the big number and they're like, oh man, I, I really want to be part of this. You have all these other big creators who are, who are hosting and spectating and it's sort of just like funnels all of this attention in just this one spot for a very brief period of time. I think this whole thing only lasted like five hours, maybe, um, which yeah, is it's... a long time in the Twitch world, but in the real world, that's just like a flash in the pan, but it's, it's yeah, super it's interesting. Yeah, it's literally a digital flash mob. Yeah. God, flash mob. That's something that I haven't thought about in a long time. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of what it's like, right? Like, it's, uh... Yeah, it's true. It, it was very spontaneous. It was very exciting. Um, and the guy was obviously very charismatic. Um, and that, like, he was very energetic. And that sort of came across, even if you couldn't understand what he was saying. So it was just an exciting yeah. time for pretty much everyone involved. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Epic Games was happy about it. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not going to claim to be someone who like really gets um, Fortnite. Like of all the games that I do, know Fortnite is definitely on the lower end. Mm-hmm. But what I, I always enjoy and I always love to see is people who are just passionate. Like people have the thing that they love. I don't even care what the thing is. See if you have the thing that you love and you get to share it with others. Um, that's the absolute pinnacle. That's the the top shelf. Um, so seeing uh, uh this guy who has shared this passion for so long and gotten an official recognition, and now he gets to share this thing that's him and the thing that he loves. Like, 2.5 million people will agree that that's just magic to see. Yeah. And when we don't really see that sort of um, feeling emanating from something like a YouTube video, uh, at least not anymore, now that we've had exposure to live events, I feel like there's just something more special about tuning into a live event than just watching a YouTube video. Um, because I feel like if that guy yeah. made a YouTube video about it, obviously it would be a big deal, but nobody outside of Fortnite or nobody outside of the Spanish community would probably go in and be like, yay, awesome. Um, yeah. Like, so the only thing magic. that I can think of that's, like, culturally on the same sort of scale was the the end of Unisanis. Uh, I'm not familiar. Please don't. Please don't hate me. <laughs> No, 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 it's fine. Like, it was a, a YouTube channel that was made. Um, it was uh, Markiplier and Crank Gameplay. And they ran a channel where, for every day, like, literally every day for a year, they posted a new video. And then on the last day of the year, they deleted the channel live. Like, they, they'd done, like, a big countdown thing. And they, but it was, like, a really emotional day. Um... They had like signature suits. They had like a full coffin. They wanted the the feeling to be like, oh, remember that you could die any day. Try and live your best life. Like all of these sort of mantras. Um. So when it came to the final day, where they were just going to like they delete the channel, all the content is gone and whatever. Um, it actually kind of broke YouTube for a little bit because the, it was a YouTube broadcast and live on air. They deleted the channel, which obviously caused like a weird thing where. <laughs> Like, YouTube doesn't know what to do when a channel gets deleted as they're live. Um, 
It was cool. It was that is cool. It's 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 sort of like a first, I imagine. I'm sure nothing on that oh, scale yeah, has sure. ever really happened before. So that is that no is way. exciting. Um, um, I would suggest go and look up some of the content they made, but it is literally all gone. Well, I'm sure. Point. I'm sure somebody <laughs> has uh, some sort of mirror, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. I really like people trying to come up with new and exciting ways to like make milestones in esports because I feel like for a long time things sort of stagnated where we we had YouTube videos and that was like just the primary medium of entertainment in gaming mm-hmm. and then now we have Twitch streams but there really isn't much more than that in terms of mainstream stuff um so I like people who can innovate and and sort of like make things special um yeah. even if it is something simple just by like making a temporary YouTube channel and then Deleting it at the end of the year in front of everybody. I think that's cool. The the only other thing that I can really think of is the the Fortnite live event. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think um, I think that is that is a great. Um, that's going to be a turning point. I think we've already seen some experimentation in other in other games that tried to like sort of capture that feeling. Um, so we're we're going to see a lot more of that, not just. From I think so games. for sure. Yeah. Um. You'd even see it now in like t- like sponsorship and stuff like that, where sponsors are having their thing be a skin in the game, mm-hmm. um, down to like the little things, like some Dota events, um, like some of the consumables have been replaced by Monster and things like that. It's like the small touches, but it's really cool to see. Yeah, especially if it it's like making a day to day difference in the game, where you can sit down, mm-hmm. you're not even interested in anything going on, you just want to play some Dota, or Fortnite, or whatever. And then you can just yeah. see that thing happening. And it doesn't really negatively impact you. It's just like a, a thing. They're like, oh, that's neat. I think that's the best way to look yeah. at it. <laughs> and I'm sure yeah. market- marketers are very excited to hear about that because that's probably what they've been looking <laughs> for forever. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Getting things back a little bit on track, let's talk more about um, Team Liquid and stuff. So when did you first okay. hear about Team Liquid? I know that you... Have been in gaming for a while, um, and Team Liquid's been around for a while. When was your first um, experience learning about this? This yeah, juggernaut. Uh, so, anyone who like looked at any sort of like con- competition or whatever back then, you were definitely going to look at StarCraft because it was the problem. It was obviously like it was a fun tidbit a decade, a decade and a half ago. The Korea's national sport was StarCraft. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're a gamer, you're going to pay some amount of attention to it. And with Team Liquid being in the scene for that long, um, like their name is something that I'll have heard, but just like acknowledged, like, oh, it's cool, there's like a European outfit out there in Korea. Um, but in terms of like getting more actively engaged, um, it would maybe even just be as recently as like some of the CSGO and um North American LCS as it was. Um just before the curse merger. Um or a, a, about that time, um about five five, six years ago now. Um that was when I started to like really, really get into it. See Team Liquid that they, they they touch on a lot of different bases. Um like StarCraft's a cool game. Now they've got an interest in uh like They've got the CSGO team. They're looking at other esports. It's it's just exciting. Yeah. It, StarCraft is, then, is sort of this um, standout game in, in esports history just because it's been around for so long in almost an, unadul- an unadul- unadulterated format where we had StarCraft uh, Brood War, which is still a juggernaut in esports, um, obviously yeah. not on the same scale as it, it was, but... And then StarCraft yeah. <laughs> 2, uh, which is now... StarCraft 2 is fairly old now. I think it's... Um, it's about 10 years old, I think. Yeah, pretty pretty much as old as League of Legends. So they're both... Um, and these games have been pulling in fairly uh, impressive numbers for ever <laughs> since, since esports started. And it's crazy. Uh, that's what mm-hmm. I love about... I... I I'm a very, very, very casual fan of StarCraft, where I, I, for a while, I got very interested in watching it. Um, I played very casually, but I I would never consider myself a hardcore fan. But I do 
think that it, it's one of the better spectator esports just because just it's so impressive um, seeing what people mm-hmm. can pull off with it. And I think that's, that's a magic that not a lot of other games can pull off if you're not familiar with them. Because people outside of StarCraft can still look at somebody playing StarCraft and being like, holy moly. <laughs> this guy's yeah, exactly. yeah, sure. guy insane. And I don't think that's like, true for every, uh, every esport out there. I think one of the exciting things for me is that StarCraft um, StarCraft famously gets solved very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then but because when it, when anything gets solved, like it's like the the playing field itself moves to adjust, and then it needs solved again, and then the, the playing field moves to adjust, and then it gets solved again. And StarCraft over the years, um, maybe not always perfectly, but by and large, has always maintained a a really fluid, um, like meta and. Uh, They've definitely kept themselves going in different directions. Um, I think that that's probably one of its strongest, uh, one of its strongest assets. Yeah, I think, um, and it's very impressive to me that they didn't fall into sort of a rock paper scissors format that I think a lot of RTSs do fall into, especially considering that there are three playable races in StarCraft. Yeah, so it would be super easy to fall into like, oh, Terran beats Zerg. Protoss beats Terran, uh, Zerg beats Protoss. And I think that in some level, there's, there's a little bit of truth to that. But overall, the better player wins 90% of the time in StarCraft versus what yeah, race he's think, playing or what, what, what type of play style he's playing. But there's definitely win percentages where, like, I think, if I remember rightly, um, but even, even if it's wrong just for the sake of, like, conversation, there's mm-hmm. def- I think it's, like, Protoss versus Zerg is like 55 to 45 in Zerg's favor. Um, but is also like on the losing side of the Terran front. Um, maybe not quite by as much. And I think Zerg beats like both other factions. Um, so, like, theoretically, there is an imbalance in the game. Mm-hmm. But. Even at that, you still see Protoss players at the top. You still see Protoss players going out and doing well in events. You still see Terran players going out and doing well in events. Um, you still see Zerg players going out and doing well in events. Like it doesn't, whatever that imbalance is, although it does exist, it hasn't affected anything other than the ability to play the opponent, which is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like there might be three races that match up differently against each other, but it's all about how you match up your opponent in a game like that and that's more important than anything yeah and i think that's the important that's the very um key essence of like what makes it a good esport is because there are things that will give you micro advantages versus like a different player but it's not going to immediately win the game in your favor or at least give you even give you a um a massive yeah. advantage like you're you're still gonna have to work for that win no matter what you're doing um, yeah for sure uh, let's talk a little bit more about how your life has changed since coming onto Team Liquid as a as a professional employee. Um, where you were before then, and where you are now. Yeah. So, um, as I sort of suggested a little bit earlier on, like me getting into Liquid was a pretty chance encounter. Um, I had moved to the Netherlands from Scotland. My wife is Dutch. Brexit had just been voted for. Soon, feel welcome. So we decided to come back to. Um, the Netherlands to live instead of Scotland um, mm-hmm. and I started looking for online work um, and that's maybe like the first important thing that really changed for me was I went from all the work experience in Scotland which was like restaurant hosting um, like civil service like I've done a lot of management in that sense I've helped to like all these little local stores a lot of face to face things um, I know I have, like I know I'm starting to work in a completely online remote environment. Uh, going from one to the other is quite a, a jarring shift, um, which I think was actually softened by the fact that I was going through the whole other thing behind it, where I'm learning a new language, I'm living in a new country, like my whole world is different from that stance. Um, so I think 
the, the circumstances that led to me getting to work at Team Liquid are probably never going to be replicated by another living creature on the planet, honestly. <laughs> like, it feels very... I, I, that's how lucky I feel about it all. Being on. It's crazy. Um, and I, I know now it, it's like, this seems like the normal for everyone living in this sort of remote and um, uh, yeah. telecommuting environment. Um, but you started before this happened. Um, yeah, this has been on for a while now, hasn't it? <laughs> Feels like forever. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Like, it's like you said, though. Like it's when it first started kicking off, and people wanted to like they were new to remote working, mm-hmm. and I was like, you could just ask. Like some of us have been doing this for years. <laughs> like <laughs> we're we're here. We're willing to help. We've got things that we know, like people coming and like talking about their different troubles that they have working from home versus working in an office. Um, but like people who just don't know how to. But if you if your recreational activities are at your computer and you're trying to work from home, trying to resolve that problem of trying to work from home and not be distracted is like mm-hmm. a huge thing. That took that took me literally months to try and get past. Um, and. I think if I was to say that I was fully past it, it would be disingenuous. <laughs> I think it's um, it's hard, man. Like but setting getting, up, getting used to setting up physical like restrictions to keep you from getting distracted. I think is something that's very powerful to learn to get used yeah. to a remote environment. Just like anything that can keep you from it from being like super easy to tab into whatever your game of choice is. Um, that helps oh, a lot. Yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. Like, I started taking on a strategy where the only games that I would take an interest in were things that either took, like, an hour to play one session of, mm-hmm. like a, a civilization game or something, or, <laughs> like, a deep story game that you can't really just pick up and play. Um, but that didn't work, because obviously I wanted stuff in esports, so I need to get, like, a hand in all of that. Um, and the way that I ended up getting stuff sorted is there's, like, a physical division. I've got two models, and there's a physical division between them. And there's a sp- space in between, and um, if I'm working, like I keep my chair on this side, and everything just looks this way. I mean, I feel like I can relax. The chair comes over here, <laughs> and we start like, right, okay, the the bigger, nicer monitor, we'll put a game up or a movie or something. That's great. I love that. I love I love when it can be something as simple as just changing position in your seat and looking at a different monitor. <laughs> but if it helps, I mean, that's that's all you need. Um, yeah, honestly, like I think as long as you can create some sort of token gesture that is, we are in work mode or we are in relax. Um, even just the smallest thing is uh important. Like one of my colleagues, when it's work time, the only thing that they have on the desk for drinking is water. But when they get to relax, that's when like the that's when like the cola or something comes out, like the like a, a monster or something. Really, or chill, we can. We can do something else. That. <laughs> That's funny. I, I love. I, I think we'll see a lot more of um, that sort of like replicating itself back in the office environment once things go back to normal, and we'll see. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think people's productivity will will continue to improve, and that was something that I think a lot of people who weren't like familiar with remote work were super worried about going into it, where they're like, "Oh, I think are we going to be able to function as a team? Our our." Uh, KPI yeah. is going to be uh, accessible anymore. Like, what's going to happen to to our company? And I think everyone, at least in my experience, has like taken it in incredible stride. Um, our company, um, there are definitely some aspects that are more difficult as a remote employee, but like, I think everyone's pretty much nailed it and knocked it out of the park. And things have never really been better for everyone, yeah. <laughs> which is awesome. I genuinely think it was always going to be easier than people thought it was going to be mm-hmm. um it was just tied to the fact that it was very intimidating because it is it's intimidating right there's Definitely. like all of these things that you've built your life around that you now have to like readjust to like anyone with a kid or anyone with an active pet like <laughs> that becomes its own thing um yeah there's just like a world of things changed yeah and i think i was very um I had an easy transition, obviously, because I was I've spent so much time on my computer and I I used to work on my computer basically all the time, so it was not very difficult for me to stop going into the office and just staying at home and doing my <laughs> job. 
but I definitely feel for those who that transition wasn't as simple and easy. Um, yeah. So what are some of your standout memories from working for Team Liquid as a community manager, both negative and positive? Um, <laughs> and so I guess it's easier to start with like the hard things. Mm-hmm. Um, working with a lot of different fans who are incredibly passionate. Um, when something doesn't go your way, um, and people have to be held accountable, um, like to a lot of these fans, like your name is Team Liquid, like you, you, you are Team Liquid. So when they send a message to Team Liquid, i.e., you, um, like you just have to, you just get hit with all of these comments, and people like reach out to you as the community person with all these questions. That you don't know the answer to because you're the community person, you're not the team manager. Um, and try to like absorb all of that for other people. Um, that can be hard. Like, fans get angry, and that, like, I, I don't want to say it's deservedly so, but certainly understandably so. Like, you've, you've invested a lot of passion, a lot of heart, a lot of yourself, a lot of emotion into the performance of this team that you support, like, these people that you have decided like this is my this is my people and when you see them like struggle and suffer you want you want accountability you want answers um so getting hit with all of that can be really difficult um i think the the hardest ever got was when we had this really extended run of coming second place in csgo um but there have been times that have been individually more vitriolic but in terms of like emotionally trying to handle like that extended period of just second place, second place, fourth place, second place, um, that's that's punishing. Yeah. Um, because and that's the thing as well. Like these these fans, like you're a fan. You're one of these fans. So you want the same things that they want, and you just have to acknowledge that they're in pain, um, and that they're struggling. Uh, when you are also struggling, but you're there for them, and like obviously it's a job, right? Not everything's supposed to be easy. Um, like even if internally you have some of these angers, some of these frustrations, you still have to be the person that points the ship forward. Um, I, I always try and tell people that they need to keep their heads up and eyes forward. Um, changing the past is very difficult, but you can change the future easy enough. Um. And that that's the sort of mentality that we're trying to push forward towards. Definitely. Um, I think I think it's never easier to do a job in working with a community than when things are going awesomely and everything's going smoothly. But that's not really what the job yeah. is about. <laughs> the job isn't about yeah, making like, making everything uh good when things are going good. It's about taking care of responsibilities when things aren't necessarily perfect. That's it, right? Like, but I I know that plumbers are important, but I never want to see one. <laughs> but I never want to see one at work. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> definitely important, hundred percent. But I never want to see one at work. So, like, if the community is running smoothly, like, it's very rare for things that are running okay on their own to need money. Mm-hmm. So, like, <laughs> if, if everything works, then your job is to try and be supplementary. Um, so, you, like, you're your position gets muted a little bit by the success. Um, you just need to be like, at, at that point, your job is to be the loudest voice. Um, but when things go wrong, like, yeah, you, the hats that you wear change and mm-hmm. people's expected stuff about you change. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that's when you have to buckle but, up and, and really take control yeah. of what's going to happen because it can be scary. Yeah. Um, yeah, my like, limited experience in, in communities, it's just like people can turn very, very quickly. And, and it's not even just people turning. It's just different aspects of the community rising and falling. Yeah, um, exactly. Like that's, that's the main thing for me. When people are angry and they don't a hundred percent agree on something, like your tolerance for like listening to the other side of whatever debate you're trying to have becomes very thin. 
So watching people who I know are friends, people who get on well on a day to day basis, who have this very slightly different viewpoint on how things work and want things to get better, like after a bit of loss, watching these people turn on each other, like that's heartbreaking. I hate seeing that. Um, yeah. But it is thankfully a smaller, less common part of the job. Thank you to our athletics team for bringing on teams that win a lot and making my job <laughs> easy. <laughs> um, but like conversely though, that's the good parts of the job when you see something come together after a long time. Maybe not even in, in terms of like athletics. When you so recently um I got to lead my first ever major project, which was really exciting. I'm not much of a project manager. Um mainly because I've been so long focusing on like smaller micro things. Like to see it from the other side was really uh unique for me. Um the Liquid 20 stuff that I was I was facilitating and helping out. Um, if you've seen any of that, that was, uh, I think, probably forever will be the most important positive thing that I've ever done for my, my, my work because it was the first project that I'd done that, was, that this was my project. Um, and everyone came around. Everyone was super helpful. The amount of people that helped me couldn't, I couldn't measure it. Um, but having that moment of like ownership and seeing something come to life that fans across the world are getting to interact with directly, that's a, that's a, that's a dragon I'd, I'd be scared to try and chase. Yeah, that's actually a remarkably similar answer to um, the only other community person we've had on the show. We had Ryan Rigney, uh, aka Riot Cactopus on, or X Riot Cactopus. And when I asked him this question, he actually answered um, that his favorite moment was the League 10 anniversary that just happened last year because um, he was a big part of facilitating that. So definitely a lot of parallels between yeah. that. And, and um, I guess it's, it's just a, it's a big event. Any, any sort of like large anniversary in, in these organizations, it, it's exciting and yeah. it's, it's uh, invigorating. I'm really proud to have put a name on it. Um, I think it was perfect. Probably not. But again, I, I don't. I, I I hate holding the sense that anything ever comes out perfect. Um, but I'm certainly very proud of it, and I hope that anyone who ever sees it or comes into contact with it has been proud of it too. I don't think anything can ever be measured as perfect in this line of work. <laughs> There's just so many <laughs> different moving parts and things that rely on so many different people who may or may not be reliable. Uh, it's just hard. Like, <laughs> There's not, not everything can be perfect, and that's fine. I think one of the most, yeah. um, one of the blessings of working in in sort of this field is that people, um, even though they want perfect, they don't always expect perfect. So I think that's that's really nice to yeah. know that it, everything's a learning experience and things are improving I always. <laughs> I think if I was able to give like one first lesson to anybody that gets involved in esports, it's that, like, 100% success is very clearly the aim, right? You always want 100% success in everything that you do, but, like, 95 is still a very strong passing. Like, you know, if, if, if someone tells you you're getting 95 on a test, like, you're, you're celebrating that, right? Like, <laughs> so, don't, I think holding yourself to the standard where you you need 100% to continue is just, like, not not smart um yeah. which in turn helps people um sometimes it's good to just acknowledge when the the thing that you're working on you can just like all right this is the thing that we can stop like we, we don't need this this is going to be extra and if we get back to it great if not right okay we'll just accept it um, yeah like that that's maybe like another hard part my company uses something called OKRs or objective key results, which is, it sounds a little bit corporate, but the main idea of it basically is um, we set goals for ourselves and our teams and stuff like that at the beginning of each quarter. And they're obviously, I don't want to say unobtainable, but they're lofty goals. They're generally speaking, 110% of what is probably going to happen. Doable. And yeah. if you can reach that, that's amazing. But it's not really expected that you're going to get to that point. So reaching maybe 
three quarters of it or, or, or four fifths of it is, is sort of what's expected. And I think that is, I, when I first came into it, I was a little skeptical. I'm like, what's the point of setting a goal if you're not going to be able to reach it? But I understand the idea of it a lot more now that I've actually been through it for a while. Um, yeah. So maybe if you're somebody out there who's not in a professional position, like, um, like, Rednecker here, uh, maybe set those goals for yourself personally and see if you can get there. And if you can, that's awesome. Set your goals a little higher next time. If you can't, reevaluate what your priorities are and sort of just come at it from a different angle. Don't dwell on the fact that you weren't able to 100% reach your goal because that's not going to help you at all. The amount of times that I've wanted yeah. to give up on a project um, and then I just came at it from a different angle and then tried something else and I was very happy with the results. Um, it, it's astonishing pretty much every time. So don't, um, don't give up too easily. Not saying you shouldn't give up on everything, but not everything yeah. is, uh, <laughs> just think about it a little bit. You're yeah. always, you're only beholden to yourself in that position like that. Um, um I think it's oh, well, we deliberately ahead. set lofty, we deliberately set lofty goals like that as well. One of the important things is that you, like if when you're striving towards that kind of goal, um, that's difficult to obtain. That's when you really start to see things that are keeping you back. Like you can see the things that, like, are pain points and whatever easier because you're stretching out a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there, then there's very clear actionables to work on for personal development. Definitely. Um, so we talked a little bit about this in, in previous sections, but. I want to see if there's anything more that we can dig into. How has your job changed um, due to like the lockdown and COVID itself? Like has uh, 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 not, not your personal living situation, not your personal working situation, yeah. but like just the job itself. What's, what's happened since things, these things changed? Uh, not live events. That's mm -hmm. the short answer. <laughs> Did you so, go and visit a lot of live events in person? I've been to a couple. I've been impressed a couple. Well, I've been impressed to one, sorry. Um, and I went to, been to like MSI when it was in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I went to like a Dota Two event. Um, like I like going to sports events live. Um, I did. I actually planned to come for the LCS opener for summer this year. Um, but that was not <laughs> an option. <laughs> like not a safe option by any means. Um, I lived uh, I lived in Los Angeles about five miles away from the LCS studio during that time. And even I was like, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I could walk there. Like, no, no, thanks. Are you, are you letting in more than specifically me? Then enjoy the rest of your day. Or, <laughs> I hope whatever you're doing is good. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just a... It's just a different world. Like, it's, it's so hard to grasp when any individual metric because not being able to do things live meant that we had to from the ground up totally rework how we do so many different things like we have our we used to always do a tailgate every single week at the LCS without fear um, we had a tailgate, we were always there we would do like little fun prizes, get fans involved before the games and then we, we couldn't do it anymore. we weren't allowed to like deliberately host a group that's just reckless endangerment so we had to work out a solution for that um we found a way to take the tailgates online we we found little cool games for fans to take part in um and it just became this different thing um and that happened for all of the things that we would do on a small scale everything that we were trying to do it was just like these little extra things that we would try and do in person. None of it could work. We couldn't do any of um, And then even on top of that, there were tournaments that were just outright cancelled. So yeah. we had to try and like make sure that our fans were okay and keep them engaged and keep them excited about stuff. Um, some esports cultures literally changed when they became online only. The CSGO one's probably the one that stands out the most. Um, so we had to like try and adjust and Basically, just acknowledge that the online state of play is different from the offline state of play. Um, Smash, Smash is another one that um, famously became like a whole different world by going online only, mainly because of 
Nintendo's failure to produce a stable structure for the, the online system. Mm-hmm. Um, we ended up running the largest ever fighting game bracket because of COVID. We ran something called The Box, which is now a weekly event. Not in the same scale that we, we convert it into like a small scale weekly thing. But when we initially ran it, it was the first ever 8,000 player online bracket. Wow. We done it in Smash Bros. Um, and that was like its own ocean of challenges. Um, it's interesting so I think... because I don't think people who maybe aren't super familiar with esports will recognize how much of it was done in person. Like when, when somebody may yeah. think about esports, you'll, you'll think about, oh, people gaming online all the time. It should, it should be super easy to change over. But <laughs> almost universally, this was not the case. Things did not go smoothly yeah. uh, instantly. It took a lot of work by a lot of different people to get things going again. Yeah. I don't know how, like, companies like ESL and, um, like, the PGI team, the guy, the, the team that did PUBG, like, mm-hmm. they they had to convert a whole bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, there's just, like, a whole ocean that, that comes into play. Um, like I said, the, the world literally gets resurfaced and you have to try and work out how to play with it. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, so, on a more positive note, because mm-hmm. it does look like things are getting better, slowly, but it does look like things are getting better. <laughs> uh, do you have any sort of like major plans or even minor plans to what you're going to be doing once things have improved, once things go back to some semblance of normal? Uh, yes. <laughs> but you can't talk about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I understand. <laughs> um, yeah, in a we, more we general... Have, like, oh, go ahead. We, we do have really good plans that we want to try and to we can be um, in person again. Um, I suggest following Team Liquid Socials. Okay. Uh, in a more general sense, in, in sort of just like the industry-wide itself, do you see... Um, revival of in-person events because I've talked to some people who think that we might end up in this sort of weird limbo where these things don't recover to any sort of level that they were previously, and we've sort of we're going to stay in this uh, online environment. I personally would be very surprised if the first wave of in-person events are not some of the biggest esports events of the time. And from that, it will come back down, and I can see it going back to either how it was or slightly above how it was. Mm-hmm. I would be, I would honestly be very genuinely surprised if, like that first wave, the first CS:GO major that is at a LAN again, the first Dota major, um, and the thing that I would point to for that is League of Legends, that did run it as a LAN. They took. They took it very seriously. There was a whole bunch of safety um, stuff put on. Um, it made the players' lives really difficult for a couple of weeks while they had to go through a bubble and then they had to go through a whole different thing. Um, like even down to the, the, the location that some of the players were at as part of the bubble was in like a really big hotel, a really tall hotel. And mm-hmm. um, so some of the players started suffering motion sickness. Um, wow. Like there's. Yeah, because like, the building was just so tall. Um, but they, at the end of the day, what came out of it was a LAN event that people really well respected, it was well received, and had some of the biggest numbers of any anything, um, anything ever, basically. Yeah, and I think um, gaming in general, just in terms of the industry as a whole, has grown something crazy over the past year. Uh, I think 20-something percent or more. Um, yeah. which is a huge amount when you come to the level of like where gaming is right now. 20% may not sound like a lot, but that's like millions and millions and millions and millions of people. That's a lot of people. Um, yeah. So I think, I think you are probably correct when things do go back to some semblance of normal and we'll see these in-person events. Everyone who really got into gaming over the lockdown is going to be really excited about being a part of that, whether it's in person or whether it's online. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be a lot, a big deal for a lot of people. So I think that's going to be exciting. And I hope that we see that in think optimistically, maybe 2022, but we'll see where things go. Um, yeah. 
Nice. I am I'm very tentative to give any sort of date on that right now. Just because we never know like it's very rare for like a, a thing like that to come and then get resolved and then go away. There's usually like yeah aftershocks and second waves and like you're even starting to see well, like certain cases of the new version of the virus coming through in London um and different parts of the world. Uh this like that now we have to contend with that. Is that mm-hmm. like how is that going to change things? So I think that anyone who has like an actual in person event planned for twenty twenty one is <laughs> uh, very, very brave. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's a gamble. Um and it will pay off for someone out there will have it sorted and it will come out well for them. But it's gonna be a hard thing. Yeah, I think betting on that is very Risky. I don't know if it, I would say risky, but it's definitely very. Um, it's going to be hard to see that coming back to normal so quickly, especially for esports organiz- or esports events. Because in terms of general acceptedness, I think that an esports event going back to an in person thing is probably pretty low on the totem pole in terms of like priorities for normal people. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Hopefully we can get things back soon, but what soon is is difficult to say. Yeah, it's, it's um, like the, the valve the valve soon. The tier. valve soon. <laughs> Do you think anything's gonna be different forever now because of what we have experienced? Do you think oh, things yeah. are gonna change? Like what yeah, what would you 100. say? Um even though in, like so at the like the little level, the small level, I can see people just like Investing in masks for day to day culture, like fa- like masks will become as long as they have like a certain minimum level of protectiveness. I think it's became even a sort of fashion item for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's one thing I was looking at getting face masks as like a fashion thing before, like a, a year or so ago. Just I think it's like a cool aesthetic. You can be creative with it. Yeah. Um, and then it became like this far more mandatory thing. So I was like, oh my gosh, like Well, in um, in Asian culture or in some Asian cultures, it was already yeah. like a very widespread thing. If you were feeling ill or or if you didn't for any number of reasons, it was like very common yeah. to see people wearing masks. So coming over I think we might see I don't know if it will ever be on the same extent um that it has been like now, but yeah. I think I think you're right. I think we will see a a, a large Increase um, in non-mandatory mask wearing in the future, but um, I think in terms of like a bigger scale, the thing that I am most excited for, and I think this will really, really change the way that esports operates, um, is even once we go back, the value of the remote worker has been proven, um, and I think that a lot of companies who maybe before didn't have the same belief that remote work was the right way mm-hmm. and there are certainly arguments to be had like there are definitely debates whether people should work together in the one office like there's definitely pros there's definitely cons but to outright ignore people requesting to work remotely um i think that's just not going to be a thing anymore i think people contend in remote work uh that's that's business suicide i think honestly i think you I have think to just well. acknowledge that remote work is going to be important it's going to be super helpful um and it in particular touches on what we were talking about earlier on where you see a lot of like the sort of slightly poorer areas who have started to get more in touch with online environments like these people they, they they're not like like the like people in say like brazil or whatever and in india and in these more remote locations who are like incredibly smart, incredibly talented, incredi- like they have so many different skills, but they never had a platform really to get that worldwide acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. You can work a way, get these incredibly talented people on team um, because you have access to remote work. And I think it's something that maybe would have been overlooked before. Um, I think that there's also the, the side of that where there are definitely going to be certain groups of people who may be trying to take advantage of people in those positions. Uh-huh. Um and like they, they feed them the 
or it can be your foot in the door and all of that garbage. But that's been that's been a thing in business for years. It's awful. I hate it. But to say that it doesn't exist is just a fabrication. It's like the internship um, quandary that's I feel like has been pushed back against very yeah. hard in the past five, ten, ten years, where it was super common for companies to bring in interns for free. And I won't be I won't be um I won't try to lie. Like interns are important, but the type of work that they do in a lot of circumstances isn't necessarily going to be on the same level as somebody who's doing a full time job. But to not pay them at all and to give them this this uh, um fab- lie, basically. I'll say it lie that like this is going to equal some sort of valuable experience or some sort of uh, foot in the door for this company for you when that's not the case all the time. And and I wouldn't even say the majority of the time um, it's damaging and it, it, it puts people at a massive disadvantage coming out of those situations, especially if their expectations were a lot higher. So I love to see more and more companies turning their intern, or intern programs less to like some sort of weird free labor that they're getting a tax break for yeah. And more into um, actual job opportunities in the future once people come out of college. Yeah. And I think I think paying people is the first step in that thing in in that in that ladder. It's really, <laughs> yeah, it's really horrible that the first step has to be like just like where everyone agrees that people should be like. <laughs> I'm not going to say that I'm some like politically like deep left or whatever, but I, I, I do certainly feel that. Do you know, maybe we should just pay people for work. Maybe, <laughs> maybe those, but maybe that should be the exchange. Maybe that's the level we should. Do. Um, but there's the knock-on effect as well that having interns can have, where it was proven a while back that if you have these, um, this wide net across all industries of these interns who are working for buttons, um, so that you can get their foot in the door, uh. What ends up happening is their salary expectations are lower than the generation before them, mm-hmm. and if you can keep that up for long enough, people's salary expectations are just going to be in the bin. Because, like, I I'm the intern for talking sick, and you're the full time employee, and I know maybe roughly what you get paid, but I'm newer than you, so I should expect less than you. I think that's like a fair system, right? You you reward experience, and then you never get put up the wage bracket. Because you, because the company doesn't want to pay more money, and then maybe I do get brought on, and we do the same job, but unknowingly to me, I'm getting paid less. In comes the second wave of interns who know that I'm the person above them, and they're like, right, I know roughly what you get paid. When I get a full time job, I should earn less than, because that again, that's how it works. You should want experience, and eventually, like, it's been like filo pastry where it's just been compressed and compressed, and like it's just getting. That's super. That's crazy. I I never even thought about that before. That's, and and of course that works out in in businesses' favor. So obviously they aren't going to want to do anything to change it. But that's that's incredible. Um, I never thought about that. Do you have any advice you would give to people who want to go in and sort of like try to break that mold coming out of this intern environment? Uh, I know that. So it's less common in European culture, but it does happen. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that it's very taboo in North American culture. But I think an important thing is breaking the taboo about just talking what people get paid. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not a shame thing. No one's trying to shame people for getting, like, earning less. Um, and there's a million different facets that... Uh, there's a million different facets about what that silence does to help the business and harm the employee. Yeah. Like it's obviously contributed to things like the the fact that women get paid less than men because it's taboo to talk about. So mm-hmm. like culturally you can get it's easier to get away with. But if everyone can just acknowledge that like it's not an insult that someone gets paid more than someone else. Like maybe it's worth a conversation with your employer, like do you think that I'm not worth as much as that person? Maybe the answer's yes. Like, the answer might just be yes, but to make it a taboo topic to at least approach um, is just harmful and causes, like, so many compound issues. Yeah. Um, you should never be afraid to just know what you're worth 
um, and finding out what you're worth is super important. Like, I, I, my job is worth less than like other people. I'm not like I'm not out here trying to make CEO salary on yeah. what my job like. <laughs> It requires, if if that's the case, it does require acknowledgement on the other end of the scale as well, that like some jobs are just worth less than others. I don't think that I'm worth the same as a CEO. There's a, there's a pay disparity that matches that. I don't think that there's, I don't think that's strange. I think that that's just a, a common thing. Um, but you at least have to be in an environment where you can talk about it. So yeah. that like me and another community manager who does the exact same work as me and we do the same job, like Sure, the company that they work for might be different, and maybe they do get paid more, maybe they get paid less. Um, but obviously, and there's the compound issue again that different companies will value different things more. Like maybe company B will just value graphics team slightly more than the social team. Mm-hmm. Maybe company C has it the other way. So when those two sets of graphics coordinators talk about it to each other or those two sets of social, like they have to be aware of the environment that they're in as well. Um but by and large, like it being a completely taboo topic is helping well, helping the one at the, the pay level, the paying level obviously benefit. Not helping the, the employees much, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's some great advice. I think I'd love to see more people um, and you don't have to like shout it from the rooftops and come out here and be like, I, I'm getting paid this much. But I think getting in contact with other people, like you said, who are doing your job or similar jobs in other aspects, even in the same company is very, I think that's a good place to start at least. Um, yeah. In terms of your personal goals and not talking about anything in terms of like where you're planning sure. to head, uh, what would your goals be? in an organization like Team Liquid, do you see yourself moving on from community work to something else, or do you want to stay in this sort of area for a long time? Uh, hard question, honestly. Um, mm-hmm. I obviously want to do more all the time, um, but there's a lot of stuff that I want to try and do that I don't know if I've got the skills to do. Um, actually, becoming a facilitator was one of them. This is a sort of relatively new thing for me that I only really picked up in the last nine months at a push. Um, I've really, really taken to it. I really enjoy the facilitator role. Um, but that sort of process of doing something new, being scared of it, learning that I actually quite enjoy it and that it's fun, I would say that I was good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, like now, I've it's like Pandora's box. Like, it's like a bunch of things that I want to try and I like not know how good I am and just be like, maybe I can do this other thing. Um, uh, like con- content's a really exciting thing. Content's always going to be exciting. And knowing what to do to make content is one thing. Um, I-, I don't know the first thing about content making. Like We, we have a-, a friend at work who does a lot of the broadcast stuff. Uh, Panda. And he is like he picked that up very quickly, and it's such, it's really inspiring for someone like me to see him do that at the same time that I was doing my own personal growth, mm-hmm. because it makes me think that there's pro- there's like a whole bunch of skills that you can just like pick up, and maybe you've just got a natural adaptability for. Um, I'm I'm just I don't know. I guess the, the short answer is oh, new skills all the time. I'm really interested to see what other things that I can do. Um, I was scared to even suggest before. And I think being in an organization that allows you to do that without making a long-term commitment to something is so relieving uh, and so empowering where you can try something like that and, and make, and try to see how you fit into that. And if you don't fit in, it's not a big deal. It's not going to, you're not going to lose your job. You're not going to break anything. Hopefully. (laughs) Um, yeah, things, <laughs> things, things will go back to what you want to do but i think being able to yeah. make a decision where you can try something new and if that's a better fit for you then you can move over transition into that i think that's really really a a, a super appealing aspect of um these sort of younger and more agile uh companies that esports generally are and, and gaming companies yeah kind of are um i think gaming yeah. companies are sort of transitioning into the more corporate structure especially the larger ones but i do see still a lot of people who are able to make massive 
career shifts in the company, which is exciting and, and um, very yeah. awesome to see. It, it feels like I feel very blessed because Team Liquid um, has done me huge favors to make it as easy as possible if I want to do something like that. And I know that I'm not the only person. Like I was saying, there's, as Panda, he went through a big thing where he decided or he was given the opportunity to try this other thing in broadcasting and he really got into it and he's super, super talented at it. Um, I know that some of the people who help do our commerce were in like a similar place. Some of the people who do graphic design, they were in a similar place. Like they just got to try new things and um, like uh, we had, there was one of our members of staff who was like this excellent cinematographer. I still is an excellent cinematographer. Um, and now does a whole bunch of work making some of like the nice apparel and things like that. Uh, like, I don't know, like, I, like at that stage, it can't just be like a couple of people who are lucky, right? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It, it must just be with the right support around you, you can achieve these goals. Um, and the, the company does a really, really good job of enabling these like hopes in a lot of people. Um, it's really, really exciting. Yeah. And I think um, it's beneficial for everyone. Like, obviously, a company wants the best person for any particular job possible. And if you can bring mm -hmm. in somebody who is already very familiar with the company itself to a different role while not losing anything, that's like a win win for everybody. That's just like, that's mm -hmm. everyone's going to be happy with that. So. Definitely something to look out for if you're in a company that allows some sort of professional development and growth like that. So yeah. keep an eye out for that. Um, any any time your company offers you the chance to learn or grow or develop, just take it. Like just <laughs> honestly, just take. It. Even if it's not something that you think that you'd be good at, or if it's maybe not even something that you have a massive interest in, like every skill is transferable. Yeah, experience is experience is like a currency almost where even if yeah. you have 20 years of experience in something completely unrelated that's still life experience like you're still learning a lot about how everything yeah. works and i think everything a lot of it's very subtle but a lot of things that happen in in business and in, in professional work environment is like this sort of social undercurrent where your skills are a huge part of what makes you valuable to a job but also there's this non minuscule amount of importance that goes to how well you interact with other people and how well you know your worth and how confident you are in what you can do and yeah. it's not to be ignored and it's different it's a different section of the pie chart for whatever type of work you're doing but it's definitely not nothing in almost any job yeah for sure uh yeah like like i i came from a background it was all face to face work it was all this, that, and then my, the the next job that I do is online and it's just speaking with fans and no one's ordering food anymore and like, <laughs> like but there's, there's transferable skills. I, I'm a big, I'm a big, big believer that all skills are transferable. Yeah, I think that's, that's really awesome to see and I think that you're pretty much the living proof case of that. All right, um, let's transition over. If you were listening just for the sort of like games news and stuff like that. Sorry, not the games news, the the professional advice and the stuff. We're going to be transitioning over into our, it's more of a uh, current events sort of thing. So if that's not your cup of tea, eh, uh, go ahead and tune out now. But if you're interested in what's going on right now, uh, we're about to talk about it. So these are a few things that I'm really excited about. And I know that aren't games interests might not be 100% currently aligned, but hopefully we can find some sort of common ground to talk sure. about this stuff. <laughs> um, so the League of Legends MMO, which has been rumored for so many years now, people have been hinting at it. Uh, people have denied it many times at Riot, but oh, yeah. officially, <laughs> officially it has come out. Uh, Greg Street has said that the League of Legends MMO in the Runeterra universe is under development. And I think um, right now uh, it's very it's not as deep in development as people thought it might be. I think it's ramping up now heavily, um, yeah. which is not good news for people who are excited to play this MMO soon. 
um, because it might be a while. <laughs> but yeah. I'm excited. I've never really been an MMO guy. How about you? Um, I've I've been in and out of MMOs for a long, long time. Um, I played a little bit of WoW when we were in Wrath of the Lich King, um, mm. and a little bit moving forward. Um, I played Final Fantasy XIV for several thousand hours. Um, <laughs> Not uh, an MMO I really, guy. <laughs> Uh, but that's the thing, like, it's a lot of those hours are like hollow hours where you're not actually doing stuff. It's like yeah, when you start yeah. to develop your, your friends and your social base, like, it's just a chat client with a really cool avatar at some points. <laughs> like, that's all it turns into some days. Um, my only concern is that there has been a lot of use of MMO as a replacement phrase for ARPG. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a small part of me thinks that we're going to get an ARPG and not an MMO. Because um, that's just the, the way that people talk about it. Yeah. Um, and as a, as a quick as I, as a community manager, see the way that they announced that game? I would be like, I'd be freaking out because I'd be going about my day-to-day -day business, everything would be fine, and then some other guys tweeted, oh, by the way, uh, MMO. Like... Please, like, so, I just want I just want ten minutes of warning. Like that's all I want. Like, from what I've from don't, what don't I've like... gathered too, um, ninety nine percent of the people who work at Riot Games had no idea this was coming. They 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 found out about it the night before at a meeting. Um, and if you if you follow a lot of people at Riot, you you might have seen something. A lot of them tweeting about like being excited for the future and stuff. And then literally the next day, less than less than eighteen hours later. Um, the game was officially announced to everybody, so that was like a very. It must have been very bizarre, um, especially if you've been working well, on this I, game forever. Um, the amount of like I, I'm without a shadow of a joke. I straight up had a conversation with a friend of mine, and we were like, "There's no way that's the announcement. Like that has to be a troll. Like that's bait. That is 100 percent bait." We were laughing at people like Polygon who had immediately thrown up an article about it. The dot. Like all these people had immediately thrown up an article about it. Like, there's no way. There's just like, this is bait. It has to be bait. There's no way their announcement for an MMO is the 14th tweet in a QA chain where he's uh -huh. like, oh yeah, by the way, MMO. Like, it's not like. It, it like, was, it was <laughs> so different and so mind blowing that it makes me really think that it is so early on in like what's going to be happening that it's going to be so long until we actually get our hands on any oh, sort yeah. of playable beta. Which is a little sad, yeah. um, but it is odd because Riot does have a history of of sort of giving some sort of flair to their announcements. They haven't, they don't have oh, a yeah. lot of experience in that. I mean, they they have like five games total, right? Uh, Valorant, League of Legends, uh, Legends of Terra, and then Ruined King, and then obviously they have a few unannounced projects that um, are yeah, those wild drift there. as well. Depending. If yeah. you want to shoot Wild Drift different from League, um, they have the fighting game. I'm really excited for uh, the fighting I've game. Played. Has been has been rumored for a long time too. Like that was out there for years and years oh, and years. It was never rumored. They literally bought like so. Seth Killian is like a huge fighting game star in terms mm -hmm. of development. Like. Seth Killian to fighting games is like Super 51 to obscure RPGs. Like, it's just like that sort of level of um, respect. And um, the key made a company, they made like this cool fighting game that had active abilities instead of like rotational inputs. Um, you just pushed like ability A, ability B, ability C. And obviously that, that borrows from the sort of uh, MOBA input system. Mm -hmm. um, and Rise and Thunder if you haven't played it, you can go find it there's like an open download alpha that you can just like, download and play um, really really good, but they literally bought that company out so that they could make a fighting game they never announced they were making a fighting game but they yeah. bought a very specific fighting game company, like it's not there was no um, thing about it uh, and, and over um, the past few years Riot has been heavily investing in tons of different companies games companies um they they yeah. something that's been very interesting to me is the new rts company frost giant who is working on some <laughs> rts 
and Riot has heavy investment in that. And I think um, it's very telling that they want to have some amount of say in like so many different possible genres yeah. because they want to be they want to be a part of the next big thing. And who knows what the next big thing is going to be? I'd be really surprised if the next big thing was another RTS. But as somebody who loves RTSs, um, I wouldn't say no to it. <laughs> but yeah, I'd love to see what they like, can I do. Think- I think that um, a new RTS can definitely be big, especially if you look at the, like, if you just look at the cast that are working in Frostgite, like, Mm -hmm. that's like, it's like really, really big RTS names. Um, But I think it will be sort of like Hades, I guess. I don't think that, um, maybe that's a bit of a lofty example, but (laughs) Hades isn't going to welcome a new dawn of, uh, roguelites like roguelite had their, their time like five years ago i don't think that the whole roguelite genre is going to be reworked and brought back to the forefront because hades was successful but it will stand alone as a, an excellent title and yeah. i think it's probably going to be the same for whatever they produce uh, out of that studio um like if it comes out as an rts i would be very very surprised if it doesn't become like the most prominent rts available yeah i think i think we'll see something at least we'll see some sort of waves um because riot really hasn't put out anything that hasn't been at least have some sort of impact on on the gaming communities in their respective field yeah um yeah for sure so. and i know it's not um really the same thing cuz it's not riot owned but it is riot invested and that means that there's some amount of resources um being funneled into that and guidance and stuff yeah um, if you had to put out a wild guess, when do you think we'll be able to sit down and play uh, Misfortune, grinding out minions in the starting zone? Twenty twenty five. Twenty twenty five. That seems that seems soon to me. I don't even know, but I think I'd love to see it. I think Riot can work fast if they want to. Uh, they've proven it time and time again with TFT and stuff like that, but. I don't know. This seems like a big project. So we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like four years to develop a world which they already have, but they have to develop mm-hmm. the actual world. Like they have to make the zones. They have to. Yeah. Uh, the playable either classes and or races. Um. Like. Oh, I don't know. Honestly. Yeah, you're, you've got me doubting it now. We've seen we've seen them like channel a lot of time and effort into sort of like building out the universe of League of Legends a lot heavier now, which I think will yeah. be beneficial to them in the future. Like, obviously, they've put a lot of effort into making the Stians and Yordles and uh, people from Bilgewater and Noxus and like yeah. have the, their own sort of cultures and communities and lore and stuff. But it's it's so much work. I think it it was either Mark Merrill or Brandon Beck, one of the two co-founders, famously said years ago that an an MMO, a League of Legends MMO, would be a multi-billion dollar project, like many, many billions of dollars. Um, Yeah, sure. So, and League has that, or Riot has that money, but do they really want to put that much into this? We'll we'll see what happens. I I think you may be more accurate than um, some people talking about more it's more of a ARPG than it is MMO but maybe the definition of MMO will have shifted by the time this comes out yeah to, to, I mean uh, that's definitely like people that. people would refer to things like Spiral Knights as an MMO but that's mm-hmm. definitely got like that central hub world then you go into dungeons and stuff and it basically plays like an ARPG although <laughs> it's an MMO um, yeah. uh, well I don't know like well I'm excited for it regardless. Like, whatever it gets, whatever gets made, I I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to give it a shot. Like, there's no way, um, that doesn't happen. Like, I'm definitely, like, I would have to literally lose my hands or something to not want to play this game. <laughs> there's um, um, there's a game that's very popular in the I think it's the Chinese market. It's called Dungeon Fighter Online. I'm not familiar with it whatsoever, yes, I know. but it is <laughs> the most big popular. It is basically the highest grossing game out there, pretty much. More than any other game. Uh, single game, at least. 
um, which is crazy to me. I've never even I like I I never really get into this, but that just goes to show like how big these markets are that maybe you've never even heard of. So maybe we'll so, see something. So What's that? It's on Steam. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it, but I I was never like familiar with the fact that it is literally the highest grossing game out there in terms of like singular game, which is crazy. Um, yeah. like when you think of high grossing games, you think of something like League of Legends or something, but um. It's just not, it's not even on the same level, which is crazy. Uh, with more League of Legends news, let's talk about the new champion that got announced because I'm actually super oh, no. interested in that. Uh, Vigo or Vigo, v- Vigo? Oh, I don't know. I've, how to pronounce I've been it. pronouncing it. I've, I've been saying it. Uh, Vigo. Vigo. Um, v- v- Vigo. Vigo. So I had a problem with this name when it first got announced. I'm like, why would they name it that? It's just going to get confused with Vagar. Um, and then I was like, I, then I realized, oh wait, Vagar is E I, not I E. Um, but even <laughs> still, I was like very upset. I'm like, this is stupid. Um, but I mean, I don't really care anymore. But it, it's it was interesting to me to see this champion that had been sort of hyped up for for years in sort of this cult community of people who were really into the League of Legends lore, and then for oh. me personally, seeing his appearance and when he came out, I'm like, oh, okay, this is not what I would expect at all when I'm looking at like yeah, the, he's... the story that I've been given. <laughs> yeah, like the Ruined King, right? Like, I don't mm-hmm. know, the Blade of the Ruined King is obviously the like, item. Um, um, as a support player, I've bought it about four times in the last eight years. <laughs> um, the the character, whatever I had in my head, was definitely not what was revealed. Yeah. And I don't know, man. Someone, someone was definitely feeling a certain way about a certain type of thing when they made that design. <laughs> like I, I, I threw it. Like I'm, I'm pretty timid on Twitter, right? Like I try and be very calm yeah. on Twitter, but I threw out a thirsty tweet. That is a handsome man. I'm, I'm very interested in a handsome man. <laughs> it's, it's definitely um, meant to appeal to a wider audience than maybe like an older grizzled. Like uh, I when I when I think Rune King, like if I hadn't had any experience with what had been happening at all, I would have thought like maybe like a skeletal Lich King type figure, where it's just like something like that. But that's not really what we got at all. Um, I, actually, I thought we were going to get the Lich King, like the like yeah, we, they were going to make Arthas, call him Sartha, and then put him in League of Legends. Like <laughs> we were getting the Lich King. It definitely seems like it's inspired, like the armor itself definitely seems like it's inspired by the Lich King. Um, well, so, if you know your MOBA history, it's very literally where that hole comes from. Mm-hmm. Like the, like Frostborn was like the thing that they used as the design for Blade of the Rune King coming forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so it would have made sense that, and the, the lore that they built up about the the Ruined King and uh, the Shadow Isles was, like, very Arthas-esque. Yeah. Um, so, to I, I, honestly, like, I straight thought, there's no way this isn't just going to be the Lich King. But I'm summoning skeletons, there's going to be, like, a Death Knight homie, I maybe get a dragon, go not Syndragosa, like... <laughs> uh, but People who don't know anything about WoW lore are going to be very confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I think I think most people who would like come into this with prior knowledge about that would probably agree with you. Um, which is why I thought it was so interesting when they like they're starting to make actual changes to the League of Legends lore universe. And and I made a tweet about this uh when I first saw this when the cinematic went out. But the changes that they're making feel like the first actual step forward in league universe lore that I've ever taken an interest in. Uh, I don't know if it's really the first step forward, but like things are changing in league and, and in the law universe. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and then on top of that, the forge game tie-in and forge for those who are not familiar is the uh, sort of banner of studios that riot has taken under their wing. And it's sort of like anything that's going to be league of legends, IP or I don't know if it's limited to League of Legends. Anything that's going to be a Riot Games IP is going to come out of this like Forge Studio network. Yeah. So, 
Um, I. Uh, it's exciting. That. So I'm a I'm an absolute scamp for Final Fantasy. Like I absolutely love Final Fantasy. Mm. Unquestionably my favorite game. And the fact that we're getting like a proper old school old school turn based RPG with like characters that are familiar and that I personally really enjoy. Um, man, I'm I'm really looking forward to that game. <laughs> really I think looking forward to that game. It rem- for somebody who hasn't played much Final Fantasy, it reminds me a little bit of sort of like a Darkest Dungeon type of game where mm-hmm. it seems like it takes a little bit of inspiration from that. But I think you were probably more correct with the Final Fantasy tie-in considering how like the overworld stuff works and how encounters are. From what I've seen, obviously, we've we've only seen yeah. very brief yeah, trailers like, and stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, like I-, I think the Darkest Dungeon like parallel is probably not as far away as... Like, instead of it being four in a row against four in a row, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be two lines of three, which is like a common thing that's been used in other games. Like there are other um like indie titles that use that as like a network so you get that feel of a tactical RPG. Um like Advanced Walls or Film Fast Tactics or whatever it will be you've got your grid and you know like, okay, you hit the front line or you hit this role or um I think they'll they'll have stuff to do with that. And I think I think probably what's mostly uh, bringing that darkest dungeon comparison to my mind is probably the Bilgewater setting. I think that's like just a very yeah. similar sort of like thing where Bilgewater is. I know Bilgewater is like more oriented, oriented towards like pirates and stuff like that, but it does feel like some of a similar um, setting and well, lore kind of similarities. Bilgewater also is the home to the. As much as it's attributed to the Void, actual Cthulhu in the WoW universe is <laughs> built for native. It's the god that Alawi follows, Nakagagaboros. I'm <laughs> definitely saying that wrong. Um, but it's like, a, that's like, unqu- like the sea god. Um, and especially when you're tying it into uh, the undead realm, like, because obviously the, the realm of the Rune King is the Shadow Isles. So you're going from this kind of rough, low technology, like, kind of dirty um, environment to, like, the land of the undead. Um, yeah. It, uh, yeah, I think, I actually think, the more that I think about it, the Darkest Dungeon comparison is really, really And I don't know, I don't know how much of that is, like, an inspiration, or it's just a a unintended similarity. I think that Darkest Dungeon is probably too new, even though it's been out for a while. It's probably too new to be really the source of like this sort of aesthetic. But I think it's sort of like a shared number of uh, setting that that other games and stuff have have explored in the past and other stories. So I think we'll see a lot more about the Shadow Isles and uh, Bilgewater, of course, through the course of what's been going on in the lore. So I'm excited to see where that goes because right now it seems like we don't have much to go on. Um, yeah. But yeah. As long as you don't exciting. kill another character. If they kill like, <laughs> another character, cool. like, I mean, they tried to kill Gangplank. That did not. No, that was weird. That was weird. I remember that event. I, I, loved, no, I actually loved the whole event. Like The event itself I thought was excellent. And I think I'm one of the few people that was like super into it. But the fact that like there was even a small chance but Gangplank was getting removed, people freaked out. Like, That's interesting. I wonder if they would ever risk that in terms of like, I think it would be, because oh, they sort oh, of rework, that's how they, that's how they did the rework, right? Where they... Yeah, that, that's, that is literally, that was what happened. That was the rework for Gangplank. That's pretty cool. I think that's a great way to do a rework, honestly. Like, tie it into the lore. Because until now, what sort of happens for most reworks is they sort of just retcon everything. They're like, oh, lore's changing. Everything's different now for this character. Uh, and by the way, they're a different character now. They do almost nothing the same. Um, I think if you can uh, make some sort of lore reason for the champion to change massively, I think that's awesome. Um, so that should be a goal for them in the future for reworks. As a, so there's like two things I could say about that. The first one is that I, as a Volibear main, yes, I fully understand. Um... <laughs> I've been a volleyball main and loved that character since announcement. I like big old bear, lightning, the whole thing, armor, whatever, 
it's just really cool. I'm, I'm super, super into it. I love all the And then obviously I had the remark, and I was like, oh, I don't feel about all this. Like, it's not my Volibear, but I'm still happy. I still like him. <laughs> um, the other thing about the way that they're moving forward with story and developing things is the way that they uh, they're going to like rework Skarner. And the same thing is going to happen here, but he already has like ties to another character. And they don't want to keep those deep ties because they don't reflect well on the other character. Um, and it's obviously the fact that uh, Seraphine is um, like a, a straight up mass murderer. Like stri- Seraphine promotes genocide of the race that Skarner is to make musical instruments and trinkets. And Riot aren't happy that that's the lore, so they don't want it to exist anymore. It's not so going to. Skarner, that's going away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're just like. They're just going to stop that this is a thing, and this weird. I got into a discussion about this on Twitter a couple of days ago. Like, could you imagine the world where they just they just accepted it that Seraphine was evil, right? But because she's like this bubblegum pop music producer, if they just gave her all of the things that you expect evil music industry overlord to have, like how actually cool of a character does she become? She's like. You're damn straight. A genocide in all those rocks, like, whoa! <laughs> I think I think the problem is is that you lose sort of that appeal, that like widespread appeal that they were going for with a character like Seraphine, where they were like, we want as many people as possible to get into Seraphine. Right. <laughs> you say that I present to you Evelyn, actual in lore mass murderer, K-pop idol. True. Okay. That's that's very, something very that popular. that's really also, interesting to me. <laughs> okay, guys. Also, Ari, Ari's gimmick is that she can literally charm you. It's like it's two people in the world can literally charm, you. Uh-huh. and she's like she's developed this like cult following. Like, there's no way, you, there's just no one is going to tell me that this isn't something to do with the fact that she can actually charm people. That she has this in lore cult following, and it's only her that has the cult following. Like. Akali, like, Akali doesn't have a massive following the same way that Ari does. Well, they, they, she has a massive following, but like the, the aura, I guess, is different from mm-hmm. how like it's treated. Um, like they, they position Ari as like a bit of a queen, as like the, the ruler in charge. Like you, you can't tell me that this isn't like... These characters <laughs> are fundamentally evil, and they don't want it to exist in lore anymore. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm very out of my depth in terms of what we're talking about. I didn't pay sure, a lot of attention okay. to, to the to the KDA stuff, but I'll take your word for it, because I think that you are probably yeah. more knowledgeable than me in terms of this kind of the thing. The KDA stuff makes me like really scared, really uncomfortable at points. Like mm-hmm. just say they're evil. Like see if you just acknowledge that these are <laughs> bad people. Like I'm all for it. Like I'm happy if the character's evil, I'm happy if the character's good. But like don't present actual evil as good. Like like can we I mean, like skip over that. Like we don't want to. You don't have to be an apologist for your own created character. Just ignore. I don't think they want them to be evil. I think they want them to be they like want, these wholesome. They, really they want them to be like these wholesome idols of, uh, like positivity towards everything that has sort of just been viewed cool. as negative over the past ten years. Um, um for sure. Weird. <laughs> it's. I don't know anything like, about it. Know. I'm not, <laughs> sure. Um, okay. My my viewpoint has been that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Wild Rift, and I don't want to spend too long on this because I don't know much about Wild Rift, but um, uh-huh. it's out, I think, or in beta or something like that. Um, I can play it. Uh, I can play it. You can through like VPN. Oh, okay. okay. Get... So it's it's out, kind of. It's uh, go, I've, it's I've coming. Got it out. I've got it on my phone. Have you have you spent much time with it? Uh, bits and bobs. I haven't played a whole ton of it. It's super fun. Um, it's maybe not for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really, I'm really happy that it exists, even if it's not something that I personally get terribly involved in. <gasps> oh, my hiccups. Um. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting direction. There are yeah. characters that are different in that game fundamentally than they are in League, like the like Lee Sin's um. Lee Sin Shield is uh, a ground targeted ability. It's not a character targeted ability. Uh-huh. So he just has flash. That's okay. He just has... Before before we get into the differences between the game the games, because that's like very odd to me. 
uh, in terms of yeah. like, the product management level. I'm just like, I, I don't understand why this decision is made. I mean, I do, but okay. Before we get into that, yeah. um, I want to talk about like, do you have any experience at all with mobile gaming in terms of just like you yeah. would choose that? Um, uh, yeah, for sure. I've definitely had like a, a bunch of different mobile games I've played over the years. How would you measure Wild Rifts versus another popular mobile game that you were interested in in terms of just like production uh, quality and, and like truly, what really what clean. you could put into it? Yeah, it's really clean, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, the the only thing that stops me getting more into it is the genre of game. I'm not not super good with. I was never yeah. good at Arena of Valor or these other mobile mobas. Um, I'm glad that they're there. I think they, they're definitely going to answer a, a market. Um, I'm just bad at them. Yeah. Well, I'm I play the same all way. my types of games on mobile. <laughs> I'm the same way. I don't know why, what it is because I think that I have fairly good motor skills and hand eye coordination, something like that. But something about it's probably, I'll, I'll just come out and say it, it's probably the amount of time that I've spent on a computer that really limits me from transitioning those skills, especially for something that looks so much like a game that yeah. I spent so much time in where trying to come from somebody who uh, I've spent probably over 500, sorry, 5,000 hours in a game like League of legends. I've played it for 10 years off and on um, mm-hmm. and taking that and trying to go to with my thumbs on a phone. Yeah. Well, I just don't see it happening. Um, it's weird. They have um... They've made it very accessible. I would say the controls feel, the controls feel right. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, they do feel ki- like the everything feels correct. Once you make some very slight adjustments, um, like learning how if you have three available auto attack targets, like say you have like you're next to the tower and there's the a minion that you want to last hit, there's the champion and there's the tower. Uh-huh. There's three different like small buttons that you can press to make sure that you always target the thing that you want to target. And there's a secondary backup system in place that means that you can definitely target the thing where, like, you you hold the attack button and then you can do what you have to, like, you you drag towards the thing that you want to target. Uh-huh. So you're never going to, once you get used to those little adjustments, um, it definitely feels like they invest some time in design correct. Um, yeah. And, and let's be but, honest, League of Legends, or sorry, Riot Games in general, has a very good skill of taking an existing idea and improving upon it. Um, yeah. And I think that if I'm not familiar with other mobile MOBAs, but I'm sure that there's some sort of similarities between those two different products where ideas have been borrowed. and Oh yeah, upon. for sure. <laughs> oh yeah. Like Tencent owns one of the largest MOBAs in China. Yeah. There's, there's, there's just no way that Tencent didn't go, here is the thing that we have in this country. We want it to look like the popular. Like, there's no way that conversation ever happened. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's crazy to me because um, coming from somebody who's never really been into mobile gaming, uh, I wrote it down as in our, on our document as a niche in quotes because when you yeah. look at it, mobile gaming is actually so much bigger than almost any other form of gaming. If you take it at the very bare sense of the term, like almost yeah. everybody in the world who has a phone has some sort of experience with mobile gaming. How you want yeah. to define that experience is going to be obviously different. Do you want to define it as like somebody who plays only like PUBG, a, a MOBA or like something like that on your phone, or are you going to go down to like clash of clans or, or like you said, clash Royale, which yeah. is actually a very competitive experience, um, which I'm yeah. not, I wasn't super, um familiar with myself until i looked in, into it and, and like this is a very competitive game that's happening on your phone which was totally new to me i was like people, people yeah. do this <laughs> yeah but. and we've got free fire as well which is like a sort of fortnite PUBG style game mm-hmm. um our team out of brazil is like one of the best um if not the best um and that's like an entirely mobile experience um I think yeah, that it's it's know. it's awesome to see more companies embracing the mobile experience, and I think that there's sort of like a phobia among other gamers where they're like, "Oh, if they go mo- uh, if they go mobile, then we'll lose what makes our thing special." And I think that's definitely a possibility. But I think that if things go right, there'll be different 
paths. Yeah, you, hopefully yeah. your game will never be worse because somebody else's game is better. I'm sure that's everyone's yeah. goal. Yeah, like there's definitely space for both. I think that there will be companies that get greedy and try and like do both. Mm-hmm. Um, Epic Games, even with Fortnite, had similar like contact points. Um, but I think by and large, it's just going to be the ability to acknowledge that these things aren't the same. We, was, we had a really big conversation, me and a couple of other Liquid community managers, recently, like, basically on this topic, like, should there be an established difference between competitive gaming as a, as a baseline concept and esports? Mm-hmm. Like, is there, is there a need for separation there? And mobile gaming was one of the sort of hot topics in that conversation, because you can definitely compete at mobile games the experience is definitely not the same as a StarCraft or a COD. Like, like even yeah, COD's probably a good example. COD, you've got COD Mobile. Like, those experiences are not the same. They're just not. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, you, you could even go into a little bit deeper with the hot topic of controller versus mouse and keyboard and aim assist. And mm-hmm. that's, that's like a whole... <laughs> I don't want to start that one. <laughs> yeah. um, but, like, we're... Right now, as things stand, it's an individual global term that was used for um, Clash Royale, that's used for League of Legends, that's used for PUBG. Um, And maybe that's not entirely the right way to go about it. And I think that would help break down these barriers that people have where they realise that maybe you can just be separate, but as it stands, they're currently in the same house. So... Yeah, I think divorcing those two things is not going to be the worst idea. I think that as long as you can convince, like the mobile gaming market doesn't care, they don't care uh, about PC oh, gaming no. whatsoever. At least the hardcore ones. Um, and it's the opposite for PC. Like PC gamers will freak the heck out if you like start to mention mobile gaming because it has so many bad tastes in their mouth. There's so many negative experiences that have been come from that to the point oh. where the poor. The poor Blizzard devs trying to release a new Diablo <laughs> mobile game. They get crucified on live Twitch for just trying to make a fun game, a fun mobile game. And Don't you have a mobile? Oh my god. Yeah. Don't you have a phone? Um, poor guy. Uh it, it's 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 hard. Like obviously as a hardcore PC gamer myself, like I never want to be in a situation where like I lose out on something because a mobile game makes more money. And that's just like how things are going, but yeah, that's just kind of how the world works. Like things just have to migrate towards what's making the most financial sense because that's just how business works. <laughs> but hopefully, yeah. we'll be able to see a, a, a good amount of priorities for each type of uh, game, and hopefully, you won't lose anything based on that. Though, what I do want to talk about is how much better Wild Rift looks than League of Legends <laughs> because that is frustrating. Yeah, that game um, is gorgeous. I, I think it's straight up gorgeous. It's made in in the Unreal Engine, I believe, or Unity, or one of one of those engines. Um, and League of Legends is an old game. Let's not beat around the bush. It has been out for ten years on the same um, proprietary junk spaghetti code engine. It's had a facelift. It's had number numerous, almost continuous facelifts over the years. But I think at the very core, it's still that game, and they're working very very hard to keep it or to change it, but Wild Rift benefited from this crazy situation where they could just remake League of Legends from the ground up for a good budget. Like, they weren't limited. So, it's a little disappointing to me to, like, look at a skin for a champion that I like, like Pax Jax or Angler Jax, and see it in in Wild Rift and be like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and then, like, go back to no, 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 League of Legends. <laughs> and, and Pax, or, and Angler Jax is just like, He's got a he's got a fucking cardboard tube fishing rod that looks awful. And it's just <laughs> ten years old. Uh, it's it is frustrating. Um, pizza feet. The and, whole and pizza it's, feet thing. But <laughs> it's it's crazy. Like you think that it would be the most obvious thing in the world where if this was being remade from the ground up, why wouldn't you do both of them at the same time? But obviously, like I don't know enough about game development to make that call. Because obviously they didn't do it, and there's a good reason behind it. And it's probably something to do with the amount of crazy money and and man hours it would take to have that work. 
but I am I am a hundred percent with you. Like where I feel like I I know enough to be like, can you not just do this at the same time? But also know enough to know that I don't know enough to like actually be like Mr. Mrs. Riot Dev, why can I not have the pretty skin and the big game? Please? Like, like, it, it, it must be frustrating and i know that that's i think that is the reason um why the differences between the games are encouraged is so that comparisons aren't drawn too harshly between the two um where it can be a different game and i was talking to a, a member of the tft dev team the other day and he said that the easiest part or the, the time when tft got way easier to develop was when they could accept the fact that it wasn't League of Legends and it didn't have to be League of Legends. If, oh, yeah. if they needed to change an ability uh, or a champion or something, they did it because that's just the thing. Um, and I think that's why Wild Rift is so wildly different, where it's not... It's League of Legends, very obviously, but it's not yeah. PC League of Legends. Um, yeah. It's, which it's is, good that they can start living their life inside this world where... They don't make League of Legends anymore. They make the Rune Terra universe. Yeah, and like even just that ability to say the other thing um, helps break a lot of shackles. Because because if you think about it, like what's one character in League of Legends that would literally never work on mobile, um, in in the current format? Like if you had to follow everything, something that come come to mind would be like somebody like Riven or Akali. Or just like a very mechanically in depth champion, um, uh, but the minute that you it's... unshackle yourself from these like restrictions where the champion has to be exactly the same, you open yourself up to like way more opportunities to where you're like, oh wait, I can do this now. Um, the so the ones for me that would be mechanically the hardest, I actually think that Riven would be super easy. Oh really? I th- yeah, like she would be, she would be hard to play. But to actually put in the game, she would be easy because, like, two of her moves are they mechanically they just they go forward. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them uh, has no zone, and the third one is just another one that goes for like you turn it on and then it goes forward. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of easy ways to do that. I the, think the two characters that I think would be the hardest are Rumble and Victor. And it's because oh, really? of Rumble R and Victor Q. Or not Victor is it the the, e. the the yeah, the death beam? Yeah, yeah. Um because I don't know how you input that on a mobile. Like I can I can see how you do everything else and like like the lease and adjustment where they just decided that the the sh- the safeguard didn't need to target an enemy champion. Like there's like certain ways that you can break through it. But I don't know how you program like all of the funky stuff with like Victor E and stuff like that. I think that I I think I'm on the other side of the boat from you, like you were from me with Riven. I think a champion like Victor and and I, obviously I haven't had a, my uh, chance to play Wild Rift yet, so I could be mm-hmm. basing this on something else. But it seems like it would be easy to like have a champion where you could draw a line with your finger. Like for a victory, you draw a line, and that's just where the E goes. Um, but I don't know. If oh, that's maybe like, yeah. I don't know if that's how that would work, or if that's even feasible with the technology. But um, where I was coming from with Riven is that um, Riven at this level, which is the entry level to Riven, is so much of a different champion than Riven at this level, which at a really high level, because of yeah. how mechanically intensive like her combos can get, where your animation canceling and like doing all this crazy stuff with item actives and stuff. And I think maybe you lose something about that champion if you do limit her to this level, the lowest level, which is what I think you would be stuck at in, in with a mobile implementation. But I don't know. Um obviously I'm not Yeah. I'm not even I a river player. They, <laughs> <laughs> um I wonder if they even just give you like the hard version of Riven. And then if she's a bad character in the game, they they'll just okay with it. Like they'll just like, okay, one character has to be the worst character. Yeah, um, if that's that really obscure heavy mechanics champion, then all right, okay. We we can we we learn the lesson and we can steal the boat away, um, or 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 maybe they do find some sort of really creative solution that, again, I'm the same boat as you. Like, I don't I don't know how they fix the problem, but 
I'm also not in the profession of fixing those problems. So like, we're in the very lucky position of being able to like point out issues and be like, that should be fixed. Yeah. But it's not my job yeah. to fix it. <laughs> um, no, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. I think uh, one of the goals of this, uh, of me, is, uh, one of my goals is to actually have somebody from the Wild Rift team come on the show in the future. So maybe we'll all be able to answer those questions um, in some sort of satisfying ability. But yeah. as of right now, I just don't know anything about it. Um, Especially from the dev mindset, because they, they're obviously wild in a way to fix these problems like mentally mm-hmm. and i think stuff like that is really cool yeah, really, really cool. sweet that's see, like, why I, that's why i'm doing like... the show it's really interesting to get into the the brains of people and just like see how their mind works um it's <laughs> great <laughs> uh let's let's move on because we're actually well we got time but let's talk about cyberpunk cyberpunk the biggest game ever um, and I'm not just saying that it was uh, the most, it was the most successful PC game launch ever. And when I wrote this down to the thing, you, you made a comment where you said, yeah. are you being sarcastic? And I'm like, no, yeah. from a, from a financial standpoint, cyberpunk 2077 was the most successful PC game at launch ever. It, it was like the most pre-ordered game of all time or something like that. Um, which I... obviously <laughs> was part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, I um, I don't know if that's the metric I would choose to define successful. <laughs> um, so, so like CD, obviously, CD Project oh, Red has been like pretty permanently damaged from this release. This release, it's sad. So, like, do you think we're ever going to see like Cyberpunk twenty seventy nine? I don't. I like, think <laughs> okay. If if I'm being fully honest and. This is just like what I've gathered from sort of absorbing all this information that's coming in online. I think that we'll see a massive expansion for Cyberpunk in the future that sort of becomes the definitive edition of the game where it's just like not, it's not a sequel, but it's not the same game where it's going to be so wildly different, almost similar to like what happened with no man's sky where the no man's sky of today is such a different experience than the no man's sky of five years ago when it first came out or whenever it came yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. Um, Diablo three as well. Yeah. And I think, I think that that's probably their goal at this point because they know that their reputation has been, like you said, permanently damaged. And I don't want to be punching down at a, at a company who's actually just been the target of a lot of terrible hate over the past month, but it, it was a, it was a nightmare of a launch. Um, it was pretty much everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Um, yeah. Which is a shame, but that's just yeah, the like, consequences for actions and, and decisions that were made by the <laughs> management. <laughs> yeah. Just like, say the game isn't ready. Mm-hmm. Just, um, just say the game isn't ready. My and I think it was so weird because it should never have been released on the the last generation of consoles like they should have just said hey this is a next gen game we can't make it work on xbox ones and, and ps4s um don't don't put it on the ps4 because obviously it didn't work uh, and they had to pull it they pulled it from the ps4 store and they refunded everyone who, who wanted a refund um because uh, it just didn't no. work oh no no they didn't oh wait did they no. not did i get my facts wrong uh they said they were going to and then both Microsoft and Sony turned around and said, no, you're going to have to go through the normal refund procedure. We are not doing anything special here. Oh, and wow. what Cyberpunk wanted to do was in breach of that, like, basically agreement they'd made with Sony and Microsoft. So they had to go through this whole other rigmarole. And the amount of people who actually managed to get their, um, their refunds was, like, not as many as they tried to make it out to be. Okay. And yeah, it, I didn't even know about that. To- it started at one point to look like a bit of a two-faced comment where the devs over at CD Projekt Red were like, we'll do everything that we can, but what can we do? Mr. Microsoft and Mrs. Sony have decided that we can't do it. What are we supposed to do? Woe is me. Um, so, yeah, a lot of what they've done came off as disingenuous. Which That's, uh, I didn't even know about that. That's crazy. Um, um, 
Like, I'm, I'm sure that they worked on some kind of solution. I don't think that was the final chapter of that story. I'm pretty sure something else happened and they, they started working towards a solution. But yeah. there was definitely an absolute ton of problems with even trying to get the funds out. <laughs> Poor guy. That sucks. Honestly, That's just a bad situation. Yeah. Um, like... And, and <laughs> uh, more news came out of, of from anonymous sources of, of internal devs who were basically yelling at the management for the direction that the game was forced to go and the tre- their treatment during that. Um, because basically they spent the better part of a decade working on this experience that they wanted to share with the world, and then it was basically forced to come out before it was ready. And that permanently mm-hmm. marred pretty much everything. Imagine it, if you were working on something for the better part of a decade, and then mm-hmm. midway through you're like, oh, by the way, this is going out. And nothing you can say is going to stop that, and it's not ready, but yeah, gotta make, we got deadlines. I, that would suck. I definitely got, I got a taste of that. I, I'm a huge Metal Gear Solid fan. So mm-hmm. like when Metal Gear Solid 5 came out, I mean, that game was not finished. Like, <laughs> there's like a full I feel like that game had a good, a good reception, though. Uh, oh, yeah. It was that, like, at least the game was functional. Like, the, the game just only had two of its three chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, like the things that were needed to get fixed to make, uh, to make Cyberpunk a functional piece of software, um, like Jesus, I don't know, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on a slightly a happy note. As, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, as a community manager, like I cannot imagine what their community team had to. I just can't imagine it. And none of it's their fault, and that's the worst part. Like, yeah. all of them are just like, they were all brought on to be super happy that this, like, the cool thing that the popular company is making, um, it should have been a walk in. Like, it really should have been a walk in for them. Yeah. And they did not get the experience that they were definitely employed to be aimed at. Um, and they have, will have to have worked very hard. Like, the guys that do the CD Project Red Community Management, my days. I, I couldn't begin to imagine what their job must have been yeah very hard it 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 must be pretty terrible and i think that i don't know how divorced it was where they weren't even aware it like i don't know if they weren't aware of what was going on with the development because obviously a game a game's company like as large as this might be so segmented that they kind of just thought everything was going well and they just played into that um but I'm even more scared of the the possible reality that they knew things were like not good, and they had to put forward this fake like uh, sheen just to make sure things didn't break before the game launched. As as a community manager in a slightly different but related industry, but like still mm-hmm. a different industry, the amount of stuff that we get told ahead of time is limited. Mm-hmm. Um. Mainly because, like, we speak to so many fans. If you end up giving us, giving community managers a lot of stuff that they're not necessarily supposed to know or, like, they don't need to know, Mm -hmm. the odds that they accidentally reveal something goes up. And that's not to say that community managers aren't trusted. We're definitely trusted with a lot of information. Um, But if you just, like, if you gate the volume, then there's less chance of a a screw-up. So I can definitely see the world where... They'll have heard things, right? Like they, they work with other staff. Like someone will have said, Oh man, like the engine for this particular car is like really goosed. We can't get it to do what we want it to do. And they'll have heard little things, but I don't think they could possibly have been ready for that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, it, it must have been a pretty, like, imagine waking up that morning or probably more likely pulling an all nighter and like that being, ugh, yeah. What a shame. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, like I think the devs that worked on that game had like has to be for most of them worst week of their life because it's it's they're they're put in a situation that they don't deserve to be in yeah. by a company that has to push a button. Yeah. Damn. Well, on a slightly more positive note, at least um, the bonuses that were coupled to the review scores because uh, a lot of games companies do this if a game gets good reviews then the dev team gets bonuses. Yeah. Um, luckily, well, not luckily, uh, understandably, the reviews um, 
the the bonuses got decoupled from their view score. So the dev team did Good. not get punished for a very successful game. Let's let's not be um let's go back and say that this was a very profitable game. They made back their money with massive amounts sure. of interest. Um uh, so obviously oh, yeah. that bonuses were due just because of that. Like like at the end of the day, this game made however many billions of dollars. So it's yeah, not, like, um... I, I will definitely debate whether it was a successful launch, but that is not to say that it was not a profitable launch. Yeah, it was, it was probably 100% so, a profitable launch. At least they got paid. And that's like, at the end of the yeah, day, that's good. a good part of it. Yeah, it's nice to know that like the bare minimum was done to like fix the situation <laughs> from the the, deserve, the the deserved reward for these people who, like yeah. we were saying before, definitely done some really messed up things to get the game out to even the state that it was in. Yeah. Like, can you imagine if they didn't put in all that extra work? Totally I sure. can't even imagine what sort of meltdown would have occurred if the company had like refused to give out bonuses because of uh, like these review scores. There would have been anarchy. I, I think I think people would have. I, left. I think they would have met the EU command, but because they're a European company, like they're based in Poland, I think. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm pretty certain they would have been pulled up in front of like the the Trade and Standards Commission of Europe. Yeah. Ugh. Well, because Rockstar done it with her, it, like it happened to Rockstar with Grand, uh, some Grand Theft Auto stuff. Um, mm-hmm. They got they got pulled up, uh, and they had to like answer like a whole bunch of very serious, like answer these wrong and you're out lot of money questions. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah I think they'd have been there would have been repercussions for those actions if they chose not to. Yeah. <laughs> um. And then final topic of the day, um, because it is getting late for both of us, actually. Uh, Very late for you, (laughs) but... um, Uh, It's like it's the middle of my day. I'm I'm okay. (laughs) (laughs) Among Us has, uh, in November, so November of last year, so a few months ago now, but they reached 500 million active monthly users uh, in the month of November, which I think by the research that I did makes it the most popular game ever. And I think that includes, like, I'm not sure if that includes Pac-Man, but I'm pretty sure that includes, like, any modern game, which is insane, <laughs> considering, like, the scale of the dev team that worked on this. I think it was, like, maybe three five people. or six, three people? Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Um, they brought and on a I fourth think... to help with the new map. <laughs> 500 million people have played Among Us. Or, sorry, not have played we're actively playing Among Us in the month of November, which is, I think was the peak yeah. of the the uh, f- uh, That's wild. fanaticism. It's crazy. Excellent. Good on them. Yeah. I think, I think it's, it's the awesome. Only, the only thing I personally hated was it felt like a bit of a token gesture when they got nominated for all these Game of the Year awards. <laughs> like it, it was definitely just like an, an acknowledgement. Like yeah. Among Us, Among Us isn't I don't want to say it's not a great game. It's obviously a good game. And it's kind of tragic that it took people years to find out, myself included, that it existed and was such a good experience. Um, but it's not like a deep game. It's not... No. There's not yeah. a lot going on. Like, it's a very simple premise that's based off of things that already exist. It's just converted into, like, a nice, easy, and accessible format. Um, and the, the fact that you can play about the rules and stuff and make it your own is also really cool. And that, that's like it. It's the whole experience. And the fact that it reached 500 million users is plenty of highlight. It's good on them. Like, <laughs> I'm going gonna, gonna to come out and say um, more definitively, I think that Among Us was not a, not, not a good game, but it, like, it was such a simple game that it almost reached a level of... Uh, Basically, like, at what point is this a game and what point is this just a method of hanging out with your friends and hanging out with, with people? Oh, yeah. And, like, like the level of, of this is just virtual, um, it's called werewolf here in the, in the, in the United States. I yeah. don't know if it's called the same thing over in Europe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was not, it's not a very complicated game. And I know that there's, like, differences between this and, like, something like Town of Salem or Trouble in Terrace Town or something like that. But mm-hmm. at the very base of it, it's not a very complicated game, like you said. 
but I think that it, it reached the public consciousness at this very weird time. And I think it's sort of like bringing it all the way back to the very beginning of the show. It's sort of like the the uh, Twitch streamer who reached 2.5 million viewers yeah. on Twitch. It sort of just hit at the exact right time and all this perfect storm of good, in quotation mark, things happened to make this the most popular game ever. It reached uh, entertainment. So every Twitch streamer and YouTuber out there was playing the game. That is obviously mm-hmm. a ma- massive reason why this was so popular. It reached us at a time where mobile gaming was very accessible and very appealing to a lot of people because they're Mm -hmm. stuck at home and not everyone has a gaming computer or a console. So it was super easy to just download the app. It was free, which is obviously the biggest reason that it was very popular. (laughs) Um, And it was just, it was super, anyone could get into it. Like my coworkers at work who probably have never played a game, a video game in their life were playing it. Um, So yes, all these different weird, I'm sure there's going to be, like hours long uh video essays on youtube about this game eventually where it's like why did among us reach such levels of popularity (laughs) and it has like some smooth talking guy with jazz in the background (laughs) talking about it um but i think it, it all boils down to just like would this game have been popular two years ago no obviously it wouldn't have been because it came out two years ago and nobody played it (laughs) so what happened yeah i don't know it's weird Um... It's cool, though, right? It's just like a total anomaly. Yeah. Um, think, and it's one I of these it's... good anomalies. Like, we get so many bad ones. Like, <laughs> it's, it's nice to know that this, things like this can just happen. It reminds yeah. me a lot, like, the closest... I was trying to think about it, right? Because, obviously, 500 million is... That's to the moon numbers. Mm-hmm. I was trying to think of, like, the closest that I could think of of a small team that make a cool thing and it just gets universally accepted. And the closest that I could think of was Undertale. Because mm-hmm. um, that was like a that was a very very small team. Um, I actually think it was more people than it made Among Us, and that think... permeated like social conscious in a big way. But never, yeah, never like that. No, and and I think maybe Undertale laid or games like Undertale laid the groundwork for something like this, where it it's not expected that everything popular has to be made by a massive studio of thousands of people or hundreds of people. Um, where genuine experiences can come from like low resources put down yeah. on the table. And I think that's really, really, really powerful um, because it shows that a game like Star- like Stardew Valley or Undertale or Hollow Knight or, um, or In the Blind Forest yeah. uh, don't have to have these massive... And I think Ori in the Blind Forest might not be a good example because I'm pretty sure they have a, a decently sized studio behind them. But... Uh... It's it's the Microsoft Studio, which sounds bigger than it actually. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a, it's not a nobody team, like it's yeah. not a small team, but it's not a big team either. Yeah, it's not like it's not like a massive studio producing it. But I think I think it's great that we live in a world where not everything has to be produced by the biggest thing. Like Game of Thrones was the biggest show out there forever. Like that was we- like, and you would never see that on a level of like. Do you think a, a couple people making something could ever produce something like Game of Thrones? Obviously not. Um, but you can have a couple people on Twitch or on YouTube producing videos that get viewed by a similar amount of people. Um, so yeah. I, I love I love success at lower barriers of entry, um, even if it's not just like the same style of stuff. For sure. Yeah, that's like a really interesting thing, actually. Like the the idea that it took three people to reach 500 million. Mm-hmm. Like, the conversion rate on, like, I don't know, like, if you're a, if you're a of religious belief, like, Jesus didn't get 500 million people. It's definitely <laughs> the biggest thing going. Like, it wasn't 500 well, million if you wanna, if you want to go by percentage points, uh, back in 0 BC, I guess, whenever that was, um, I think... It was probably a, a relatable percentage, at least after a while. Um, but no, I think you're right. I think that it, it's hard to believe that something this small has, like you said, converted so many people to to something. It, it's crazy reaching that amount of people. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, good good on them. Uh, I wish mm-hmm. them all the success. I hope the fourth map brings 
a lot of the initial wave back. I say initial wave, the wave from last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really that, was, that was the only thing I had written down for this. Is like, do you think, I feel like we've reached the other side of the peak of Among Us hype, where yeah. we're not, I don't think it's ever going to be bigger than it was. And that's not a bad thing. Like, obviously, things, yeah. things are changing. Um, do you think it, it's going to be a footnote of history where it just ends up going back down to relative obscurity? Or do you think it's going to like retain some sort of cultural presence for at least a decent amount of time? My, my heart says that it's probably just going to die out. Um, it'll, it'll, it won't be like a fast thing. Mm-hmm. And it will always be remembered as something that was very important in a time that really needed that kind of levity. Mm-hmm. Like, the, 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 the period that Among Us came through, like, really just fixed a massive hole for so many people. Um, so it will always, it will always have that and it will always be loved, but every, every game eventually, what, once you're through the other side of it, every game dies out. Yeah. As much as, I... like, some games try and retain that. <laughs> as much as we can look at, point to examples like League of Legends and, and StarCraft and, and um, other games like that, it takes such a massive amount of resources to retain that public consciousness oh, yeah. that I don't think it, it like, as, as impressive as Among Us is, I don't think that they'll be able to maintain that. I know yeah. that's not a bad thing. Like, move on. It's, it's okay to move on. Um, and yeah. I think their next project is going to be very well funded. So whatever they want to work on next is oh, yeah. <laughs> obviously going to be, um, I, any VC, like, I don't even know if they need to go to VCs. Um, cause I don't know how profitable among us was. Cause I know it is a free game and it wasn't heavily monetized, but I'm sure they have some sort of, um, amount of how money. many, how many people do you know that bought the like the PC any game. one of the two bundle well yeah so on PC it was two dollars mm-hmm. um but how many people do you know that maybe even bought the like a little companion bundle like I know that I bought one of them I wanted yeah I wanted yeah. the little to run about and follow me so like I paid an extra two dollars there and if you can get five hundred million people to pay two dollars you have made one billion dollars <laughs> like that's true like, like before fees and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that even if they didn't make that much money off the game itself, I think that there would be plenty of, of investors who would be very much interested in, in funding oh, yeah, whatever sure. else comes out of this. And I don't know if that funding is necessarily like the best place, but not every investor like knows what goes down in video games. So yeah, um, there's going to uh, be a lot of money going towards it. The, the um, only just as like a last point on it, the thing that I think is really interesting that's came about from this is the crowd that were all on Among Us, a two-year-old game, mm-hmm. uh, like in that, that popularised that, have also then sparked a resurgence in the next sort of social zeitgeist in Rust, which is yeah. another game that's like, what, five or six years old? Um, that is odd. Not, is that? And that, I that think, game has... I think no Rust, Rust is way more of a spectator sport and i use that term in a wa- wildly Very inappropriate <laughs> yeah wildly yeah, inappropriate way know. um where n- probably not that many people are going out and downloading rust and playing it um in terms of a percentage based on how many people were playing among us um but i know I, I agree i think it's it's crazy to see how fast a game like rust just blew up after it's been out forever and everyone or people in, in the PC gaming sphere are familiar with Rust, but right now it's like probably the most popular it's ever been by a large margin. And like you said, it's five years old now or something like that, um, which is crazy. But um, uh, yeah, it's weird. Every I think I've I been just, saying a lot of things are weird tonight, <laughs> but it I was. Mean, it's, a, it's a weird time. It is a weird I was time. just taking a quick look there at the the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, I just brought up like the Steam chart. Uh, it's probably not the full number. But over the last 30 days, which is when obviously Rust started to really kick off, over the last 30 days, it is plus 51% gain in 
players, and the peak players being 243,000, which, while it's not half a million, is still pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'm sure nobody on the Rust team is sad about that. <laughs> I saw the game creator <laughs> who came out and was talking about like the hype about the servers, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, because when you think about it, okay, last aside, and then we'll end the show. When you think about it, a game creator is in like a weird position where they have all this sort of power and stuff because not power, but they have this influence because they've created this game that's loved by millions of people. But also they're like, they're not Pokimane. They're not Shroud. They're not yeah. SQC. They don't have like this mainstream um, personality that, that is going to be seen by millions of people. So it, it, it ends up, ha- they have influence over the influencers which is a very weird situation to be in. Um, because, like, it's who's... like, a two-way thing. Yeah. It's, it's very odd. Because, like, if, if the guy's name is Gary something, he's the guy who made Gary's mod as well as, as Rust. Um, if he went out and streamed today, how many people do you think would watch his stream? Oh, yeah, exactly. Like, if it gets like... to 10K, I'm <laughs> genuinely surprised. Versus... Um, XQC who hits 70,000 every day or whatever it is. It's crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a weird thing to think about. But I want to end the show now because we've been going for a while now. Thank you again for coming on, Necra. I know this was sort of an impromptu thing. I sort of just asked for uh, potential guests on Twitter and somebody was like, hey, you should have Necra on the show. I'm like, oh, sounds good to me. Let's make it happen. Yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm glad. It was a, a friend of mine, CJ, who popped his head in Charlie. Yeah, CJ. Um, uh, CJ was actually cool. on the show uh, uh, in the past. Yeah, um, he he's a he's been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, but this is cool. I'm I'm glad to have done this. I think it's a really cool experience. And thank you for giving space to like sit and listen to my nonsense. <laughs> it was fun. I, I had a lot of fun, and I hope that um, people who listen to the show enjoyed and hopefully got something educational as well as entertainment out of it. Um, but if you want to check out necra what he does uh, obviously you can follow team liquid stuff because uh, he works on that but if you want to check out his personal twitter it's at red necra uh r-e-d-n-e-k-r-a um and then do you do anything else i know you stream a little bit but not, not I, do, really. I do a lot about streaming but yeah it's uh, a lot of the things that you'll get in contact with or things that i do through team liquid or um my, my social media um I would just always, if, if I was to plug something, I would suggest people get ready for Liquid Plus. And um, that's a really exciting project. Right. Keep your eye out on it. It's like a big fan thing that we're doing at Liquid um, as a thank you. Uh, keep, keep your eyes out on that and look up the stuff that we've already had out for it. Okay. Keep an eye out for Liquid Plus and get into it if you're a Liquid fan. Um, if you are a fan of Dev Dive, why not follow the live stream at twitch.tv slash Nighthawk20000? And if you don't want to watch it live, you can always watch the VODs on YouTube.com slash Nighthawk20,000. And if you hate watching things, you can always listen on any popular podcasting platform such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Uh, Give us a follow and a rating on any platform. It helps the show a lot. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm actually very grateful to everyone today who came in and uh, shared kind words on the Reddit threads and in my Discord. Appreciate you all a lot. Um, the Discord is really pretty much the best place to be if you want to be part of this community, and that's discord.gg slash Nighthawk. Um, so if you want to come in and say hi to me, I'd really appreciate it. Talk about whatever. Uh, share ideas for the show. Plug uh, possible guests for the future. Let me know. Uh, and as always, I really appreciate everyone who comes out to the live show, listens online, or watches on YouTube. You guys mean the world to me, and I hope to see you again in the future. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening.